in the YouTube so that it will be visual to all of you. So we will start this session. So a very good and warm welcome to all the pa guests and participants. Uh, I am Dr. Shubana Thakur. I am currently the head of Department of Bioinformatics and on behalf of my department, I welcome you all uh, for this one day webinar uh, on metagenomics and bioinformatics organized by Department of Bioinformatics, University of North Bengal. So the theme of this workshop is uh, bioinformatics in comparative metagenome analysis, unwrapping the mysteries of microbial world. So metagenomics is a new branch of science which deals with the study of collection of uh, genetic material, mostly genomes, from a mixed community of organisms, mostly microorganisms. So basically in uh, microbial terms, so metagenomics usually refers to the study of uh, microbial communities from various uh, niches. And bioinformatics uh, has a very important role to play in the field of uh, metagenomics. And our guest will uh, further enlighten you uh, on this topic. So uh, we have two very eminent guest speakers with us, uh, Dr. Chan Rai and uh, Dr. Ridhiman Ghosh. And uh, they are very experts in this field of metagenomics and they have immense experience in the field of metagenomics. So, uh, so without further delay, let's uh, start uh, this session. And for introductory session, so we have, we are very fortunate to have with us Professor Anudhi Chakraborty from Department of uh, Biotechnology of uh, this university, University of North Bengal. So uh, Professor Chakraborty uh, is a very uh, old collaborators of our guest and he knows this field very well. He, has, he also has immense experience in the field of metagenomics. So now I would request uh, Professor Chakraborty to uh, introduce this topic, this theme before us. So it will be very much uh, uh, enlightening for all our guests to know about this topic and uh, to tell about the objective of this uh, webinar. So I would uh, now request Professor uh, Chakraborty to take over the screen and enlighten us with his talk. Sir? Professor Chakraborty? I think uh, sir is facing some problems. Sir has left the meeting, so. No, I'm I'm trying to ring him up. I'm I'm trying to ring up. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, maybe he has some problem with the sir. Uh, yes. Sorry uh, for the glitch. I think uh, uh, Professor Chakraborty is flashing some glitch with his. Uh, uh, yeah, he was he was uh, in some trouble, but uh, obviously we can't start without him. Yes, I'm yes, trying that's to joint. Yes, him. Professor yeah, yeah. Chakraborty, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, join. Yes, yes, join. Sir, Professor Chakraborty. Yes, yes, I can see you now, sir. Sir, can you see me? Yeah. Is sir, your mic is turned off, I think. Your mic is turned off. Yeah. Yes, what are you doing? Yes, sir. So, yes, yes. Yeah, the term metagenome is 22 years young. Though the term metagenome came off late in 1998, the reports about unculturability of microbes go 100 years back to 1898, when Henrik Winterberg wrote about culture, the so called anomaly. The work of Carl Richard Booth in nine point explicated that the 16S RNA gene was functionally crummy. And this proposal of Booth changed the whole progression of microbiology at that time. The idea that 16S gene from the environmental samples can be directly cloned was first put forward by Pace et al. in 1985. Now, interestingly, the arrival of NGS technologies has left most profound impact on metagenomics 
and expanded the scale and scope of metagenomic studies in a way never imagined before. The first NGS technology which could be materialized due to incredible amalgam of nanotechnology, organic chemistry, optical engineering, enzyme engineering and robotics became a viable commercial offerings in 2005. The NGS platforms have paved the way to directly sequence the metagenomic DNA, circumventing the need for tedious steps of cloning and library preparation. NGS platforms actually allow massive parallel sequencing where hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions of sequencing reactions are performed and detected simultaneously, resulting in very high cheap. In the last two decades, metagenomics has been applied extensively to exploit concealed potential of microbial communities from almost all sorts of habitats and also enabling a discovery of novel biological functions of commercial importance from metagenomes of diverse habitats. Although several bioinformatic tools for sequence assembly of sequences of metagenomic origin have been developed in the past few years, which have simplified the task to some extent, still post-sequencing analysis is most challenging. Constant efforts are underway to improve the accuracy of alignment of NGS data in several laboratories all across the globe. Therefore, conceptual advances in microbial science will not only rely on the availability of innovative sequencing platforms, I repeat, but also on the sequence independent tools for getting an insight into the functioning of the microbial communities. This is an important issue now, there has been a paradigm shift of metagenomics from basic study of community composition into insight into the microbial community dynamics for harnessing the full potential of uncultured microbes with more emphasis on the implication of breakthrough developments, namely next-gen sequencing, advanced bioinformatic tools, and system biology. I have a great and large praise for the Department of Bioinformatics, particularly to two enthusiastic faculty members anchoring this event as conveners, Dr. Suborna Thakur HOD and Chironjeev Sarkar, had in their mind the intellectual fusion of metagenomics technology with advanced bioinformatics tools to bring out the science. So the webinar is on bioinformatics in comparative metagenomics, unwrapping mysterious microbial world. We have two brilliant speakers today. Dr. Chuan Rai, a tremendous enthusiastic scientist, trained under the guidance of Professor Ghosh, has established himself in the field of microbial research. Dr. Ridiman Ghosh, my brother and friend as well, much above the term called collaborator, I would love to call ourselves as co-thinkers, and his talk will elucidate the brilliance of the scientific leadership emanating from a scientist who is literally made in India. In course of the lectures following ascendancy from Dr. Chayan Rai, the webinar would reach the climax attendant from Dr. Ridiman Ghosh's talk, and we will understand how we improve the metagenomic technology for accommodating the needs of microbial biologists. Thank you, Subarna. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir, for explaining the concept of metagenomics and for encourage, encouraging us for uh, conducting this uh, webinar also. So, very thanks to you. So, without further delay, now I would request our first guest speaker for this uh, session. He is Dr. Chan Roy. He will be speaking on the topic advances in metagenomic studies, application and example. So, to give a small introduction to Dr. Chandra, of Western University of Health Sciences, as California, USA. So, 
before that he also worked on uh, as a postdoctoral fellow on a human gut microgenome uh, microbiome in south dakota state university uh, dr chan rai has uh, done his msc from uh, vishwabharti in botany with applied and fundamental microbiology then he went on to do his uh, phd at both institute under the guidance of uh, dr ridhiman ghosh who will be joining us later so uh, dr chan rai has uh, immense experience in this field of metagenomics and he has many publication related to that sorry uh, oh sorry i my uh, uh, I, i i i if i couldn't hear you uh, but uh, uh, can you hear me all of you can hear me i hope yeah yeah we can hear you. yes yes thank you so yeah. i i was so we can hear you. Yes, so I was introducing uh, uh, Dr. Chan Rai, and uh, Dr. Chan Rai, uh, as I told, is uh, working as postdoctoral uh, research fellow in Western University of Health Sciences in California, USA. And Dr. Chan Rai has immense experience in the field of metagenomics, so he has many publication related to that uh, in some of the very important. Uh, uh high impact uh, journals like scientific reports and then computational biology and chemistry so without further delay i would request uh, dr roy to take over the screen and to deliver his talk so dr roy uh just i will just pin you yeah uh, yes yes can you hear me can you hear me dr yes roy? yes Yes, please start your. Uh... Sure. Just. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Uh, no, it's not oh. visible right now. I just shared my screen. I guess there is some lag due to network. Can you see them now? It's not visible right now. Yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Advances in metagenomic studies. Yes, yes. We can see yes. the slide. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's a nice introduction. Like, uh, I just want to say a few words. Like, it's. Uh, it's like a completion of a cycle for me like uh, i started my phd in ridhiman sir's lab 10 years back and there i uh, defended my candidature in front of him and today i'm presenting alongside him that's a big opportunity for me and i just want to thank him and ranadi sir and dr shakur for this opportunity yeah now let's start with this advances in metagenomic studies applications uh, and just a moment i uh, just share your screen i think uh, there is some problem with my screen so it's not coming in the youtube so just a moment sir just a moment sure because uh, we are streaming in the youtube so maybe okay. there is some problem with the because my student just told me that it's not coming in the youtube so is it coming uh sorry we are already streaming in the uh there is some problem with the streaming maybe okay other persons can see my uh, screen right Just I just want to make sure that the problem is not with me. No, no, no. It's problem now. It's not with you because uh, we are. Okay. Is it? Can you please again uh, stream it now? I'll just again uh, just you can just off it and again stream it. I'll try to. Okay. Um, you you want me to stop sharing and then again reshare? Yes, yes. Is it fine now? Is it visible now? There is some problem with the. Yes, it is visible. Oh, okay. Just a moment. Your PPT is visible, Doctor Rao. Okay. Just a moment. It's uh, just a moment. 
give me some time. Sure. Yes. So it's now, I think, visible in uh, the internet. So please, uh, Dr. Roy, please go through uh, your slide. It's now visible uh, in the internet only. Okay. Sorry for the glitch. Uh, we are trying to stream in the YouTube. So there was a small glitch. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> so as you can see that my title is Advances is Metagenomic Studies. Uh, I will discuss about applications and examples. So these are the topics I will cover throughout my talk. That there will be a very brief introduction, so I will not tell you all the details because uh, Randi Sarah has already given you a great, very great background and all those details. Then I will touch a very little of human gut microbiome, where I will share my own findings and also findings from other people's what have been novel discoveries, and there are few controversies, and those are very, very pertinent controversies, and those are related to the human gut microbiome project. Secondly, I will uh, also discuss how you can link metagenomic study to application through one of an example. Why I will touch this one? Because as uh, Dr. Akul says that metagenomic study has now reached uh, 22 years of history almost. And throughout these 22 years, there is a lot of development has been made and metagenomic analysis has now become a routine. So, Instead of doing just routine meta metagenome sequencing and then analyzing those data through comparative, obviously those are important. But ultimately, if we look at the bigger picture, we need to uh, apply those findings to the application perspective. Then I will discuss some of the challenges in low diversity metagenome. That will be a specialized discussion. That if you if you consider some of the environments like it could be related to human body or it could be related to any uh, environmental features. How you can deal with those environments where the amount of DNA is very low and how you can uh, consider those diversities uh, from comparative perspective. Then I will touch a very brief uh, new concepts about the metagenomic study. There I will discuss mostly the uh, controversies of OTU clustering level, like at what percentage we should cluster the uh, sequencing reads to generate OTUs. There is a new concept nowadays coming that uh, people are doing a, um, generating ASVs, the amplicon sequence variants. There's, those are also called Z OTUs, the zero radius OTUs. What is the difference of ASVs and zero radius OTUs with the traditional 97% uh, clustering level? I will also discuss Another interesting topic that whether we should rarify our data, that means for comparative study, the comparative metagenome analysis, whether we should start from a uh, same amount of reads for all the samples, or we should go ahead with whatever reads we are getting after quality filtration. Then I have selected this portion, some useful resources, because I, uh, I asked Dr. Thakmud that who will be the target audience. And so she told me that uh, PhD scholars and many MS students also will be there in the audience. And I have, I mean, I selected this one because I have faced several challenges and problems while uh, analyzing those high sequences back in my days. So I will give you some resources or some links from where you can get the help for metagenome analysis. You will get the ideas, you can get the sequences. And obviously, I will give you some link to some high performance computing system because obviously you need some high performance computing to analyze these data. So let's start with this introduction one. The basic problem of metagenome uh, analysis is that nowadays it's actually present in a middle juncture. Like uh, you can say it's a developing science because it's just 22 years of history. And also every day, I mean, if you are keeping a track of the new publications and all the developments, you can see that at least every month there is a new tool is coming up, which uh, they are doing benchmarking and they are saying that uh, this tool is better than previous one. Now, suppose you have start analyzing your data with some tools. It took suppose one or two years, what you will do after two years? I mean, will you again reanalyze the data with the new tools or you will stick to your old analysis? 
Another thing is that the thing that I just discussed that it is an interdisciplinary science. Now, one science can become interdisciplinary science after certain stage of development. Now, metagenomic analysis or this NGS-based analysis has reached certain level where people are like to collaborate with other science. Like metagenome has become a big, uh, big structure. Like the science of metagenomics, you can say that has increased so much that one just cannot think from informative perspective only. That's the current scenario in the global perspective. It must be from a collaborative point of view. Collaborative in terms of interdisciplinary. Like if you say some big papers, it's like important papers, you will say that people will uh, collaborate with some immunological data, obviously. And you have to think about the bigger picture from a multidisciplinary science or a multi-institutional project. On the contrary, you can also say that for the developing science, the field is still under development phase. With uh, 20 to 22 years history, but with no clear SOPs for any kind of uh, tools or any kind of like if you are doing culture microbiology or classical microbiology, you know the path to go for this one. Like you have to culture them, you have to characterize them, and there are certain uh, sets of taste, biochemical taste, those are fixed time, but that's not clear cut. I mean, there is no clear cut path for metagenome analysis. I can start uh, from directly a differential distribution in a comparative point of view. I can start from uh, assembling my data and then compare between the metagenomes or I can uh, start from uh, mapping the reads for a part particular organism of interest. So what I mean actually that first question uh, will come to your mind, first question should come to your mind that what do your data, where to start and how to get the idea regarding with whom you should compare. Like nowadays there is a uh, question keep arising every time when uh, some big paper is coming, like editors are asking or like there are some big projects has already started in US and Europe, I know, that you need to put your data, your uh, sequence in a perspective. Like suppose you explored one community, what is the status of your community? Uh, I mean, where the status stands with respect to other communities. Like if you think about uh, NCBI database, you cannot compare against the whole NCBI database with simple computational power. In that case, I will all, always suggest to go for MG Rust or IMG as a starting point. Then you can get an idea that what is the status of your sequence or your community. I mean, you can always understand that uh, in the next decade, advances in our understanding of microbes and microbiomes will likely transform our ways like providing novel therapeutics, alternate energy sources, and shaping fundamental doctrines of biology. That's a common phenomenon. It's going to happen. It is critical that we improve the inclusivity and diversity of our research agendas and teams so that science benefits people. Obviously, that's the basic aim of all the sciences. If you think about the metagenomes, now microbes have already shaped the course of humanity. Obviously, we know that. And recent studies have also revealed that our healthy existence is intricately reliant on the microbes. Uh, initially, it's, uh, that was in 2011 or 2012, I just cannot remember. Initially, there was a proposal that uh, the number of microbial cells is actually 10 times in our body than actual human cells. Later, it was changed to that it's an equal proportion of microbial cells uh, present in our body. Now, this metagenome sequencing is obviously have two approaches. One is uh, for the environmental microbiome sequencing. And I love these pictures. These are the areas where I've uh, spent many times uh, for sampling and doing experiments during my PhD time. Uh, when considering environmental microbiome, that's the one part of the metagenomics. In the past decade, we have witnessed uh, fascinating advances in the study of microbes from diverse ecologies, like including intricate symbionts and submarine volcanic eruptions. Like I have also worked from uh, OMZ sediments, uh, from ocean sediments, uh, 
uh, hardy survivors in the Atacama Desert. They are Atacama Desert to present in the border between Peru and Chile, I guess. And those are considered uh, analogous conditions to Mars because of the cold and extremely dry conditions and huge fudges. The large, uh, I mean, you must have heard about the large nucleocyto uh, cytoplasmic viruses, the DNA viruses, which is having a genome, a virus with a genome size of close to one MD. Now, focus efforts like the Tara expedition, that's a ocean metagenomic project. Like people are trying to mapping the microbiome diversity in the global ocean scale. So there are several expeditions, mostly from US, Japan, and nowadays India is also involved in global oceanic uh, explore, uh, exploration studies. Uh, like Tara expeditions, the Earth microbiome project. So you must have, if you have worked with the 16S, then you have, uh, you must have heard about the V3, V4 or several variable regions present in the conserved 16S. And those uh, variable regions and primers targeting those regions were first uh, hypothecated from this Earth microbiome project. And those projects actually had leveraged massive sampling in combination with high throughput sequencing. And that have significantly expanded the catalog of known microbes. Like when this metagenome was not started, so we can say that we know only 0.5% of the total microbial diversity. But after these 22 years of high throughput sequencing, now we can say that at least we know the 5 to 10% of the total microbial diversity in the world. Why this? Sorry. Yeah. While these innovators are invaluable in advancing our knowledge, it is humbling to remember that despite our best efforts, we are still only sampling a minuscule fraction. Like sometimes people ask that, uh, what is the need of doing all this metagenome? Like everybody is doing this metagenome. Then you can say that even after all those efforts, we are still exploring new phylas, new genomes. It's not only phylas, so that's actually indicating that there is a lot of diversity still there, which are yet to be explored. It is humbling to remember that despite our best efforts, only 10 to the 12 microbial species predicted to currently exist. And even smaller fraction of the organisms that have ever existed and will exist in the future. Uh, you can say that in new decade, we anticipate learning new facets of the rules of life and biocatalyzed chemistries, what the Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Lodi just said, from these novel microorganisms, like for new strategies assembling complete genome from the metagenome, that's called genome bin or population genome bin, uh, tracking mobile genetic elements and extra chromosomal elements may finally allow us to comprehensively find out uh, the dynamics of evolution and change the genetic material. And now these are the perspective from the environmental point of view. Now, if we consider the animal human microbiome, there is a lot of work has been already done and a lot of work is going on. Like, uh, European Union has recently launched uh, three projects, three massive scale projects, $20 billion uh, euro, uh, targeting human microbiome, but for specific disease, like one for cancer and there are uh, two more. So there are different human body parts you can target, like nose, mouth, lungs, stomach, colon. So much work has been done on this colon and stomach, and then sexual organs, like a lot of metagenomic studies going on for uh, vaginal microbiome study and also the scheme and those are the left column shows the influencing factors for which you can do the i mean people is doing the association studies like with genetics uh, the environment effect of environment effect of diet so i will discuss a little more about the diet because much work has been done on this diet it was obviously it was easy to collect the samples from the fecal material and people also tries to map what is the effect or impact of lifestyle on human microbiome what are the hormonal effects on microbiome and what are the industries or other physical parameters that can affect our uh, gut microbiome. Now, to study the human microbiome, that probably takes us back to the Anthony Levinick. Maybe that's a big statement, but obviously he, he started, uh, he invented the simple microscope and first saw bacteria. That's from one environmental sample, uh, that's from ponds come and between his teeth. Through concerted efforts, now jump to the modern era, 
where through concerted efforts over the last two decades, we now better understand, obviously, the identity of microbes that inhabit the human body. After all those studies and through those massive large-scale human microbiome projects from NIH. Although in certain cases, we even understand the roles of specific microbes in the maintenance of our health. I will discuss a couple of the disease-related conditions related to metagenomic study. And despite some promising advances, the holy grail of microbes therapeutics has under-delivered. Because as I told you that we need to uh, join our microbiome-related study to some application-based uh, Ultimately, application-based study where we can get some fruitful result. It's, uh, it should not be solely dependent on the exploration of any environment. However, as we move past the first wave of exploratory enthusiasm, that's the important thing, the field is making rapid progress. Like in terms of developing computer, computational algorithms, genetic tools for microbial manipulation, and improved metrics for measurement. Like if you have done this uh, analysis of 16S or short uh, transfusion, whatever you must have come across all those indexes like Sanon index, the alpha diversity index, the OTU, uh, the raw OTU, the other richness index like Chow one or ACE index. You must have also come across with the uh, beta diversity index like weighted unifrag or unweighted unifrag, grape parties, jacquard or whatever it is. So they are still in developmental stage. That's why there is a confusion regarding the metagenomic study. Should we call it as a developing science or should we call it a interdisciplinary science? Now we anticipate that uh, the understanding, the intricate signaling between microbes and with the host through small molecules and peptides, that will be the future people are predicting for the metagenome study, where the metagenomic study will lead us through the small molecules and peptides that will be obviously one of the future area of focus, a key progress that will yield therapeutics and, and obviously clinical interventions. Now I can discuss something about the transformation of tools and technologies, like what are the exact tools, I mean, where, in which areas people are kindly working. Sorry. The biggest challenge in the, the tool exploration, the unknown remains our deep familiarity with the known. I mean, we have to understand that to what extent we know the microbiome or to what extent we know the metagenome itself as a study. Therefore, we need to constantly remember that our old world view of microbes and their potentials is based on a fraction of the existing diversity of life. One strategy to develop uh, enabling futuristic tools is to remain unfettered by current biological principles. So even you are doing an uh, metagenomic study or uncultured study that should come from the, that should follow the biological principles. Like if you thought about the cause postulate, that your study or your analysis should be reproducible. That's why nowadays journals and all the editors, they are uh, constantly keep you pressurizing to make your data public, make, uh, submit your data to some uh, open source uh, forum, like you can submit to NCBI, you can submit to uh, European unions, there is one from, I guess, DDBJ, Japan uh, database project. So you have to make that data public so people can work and you can make uh, your analysis reproducible. And learn the fundamental science, obviously from the mathematics, physics and chemistry, it has to be an interdisciplinary science. Mathematical frameworks that can handle the inherent nonlinearity and stochasticity and complexity of biological problems, assembling multi-omics data at a system level. The system biology approach will be the future, obviously, in terms of a development of tools. Like uh, as just uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jafrodi said that what can be in the future, like what we can predict even without incorporating the sequence data in our analysis. That will be the system biology or that will be the machine learning approach uh, that will be the future of this metagenomic study. And uh, to some extent, you can say that cutting is physics also has pushed the boundaries of the microscopy and down to even visualizing folded proteins. That's a different perspective, but that's for the whole ingesting or whole uh, uh, bioinformatic bio development, not only related to the metagenomic development. Now, finally, I will conclude 
this introduction in this way that uh, finally if we look ahead and chart the course of our exciting explorations of microbes and microbiomes you can say that two stock of who is privileged to participate in this journey and who reaps the most benefits from its boundaries like this is uh, this can be a kind of controversial statement but obviously there is a big bias in terms of microbiome study because of obviously the fund availability lack of fund uh, from the westernized population and from the non westernized population now because of that there is a lot of controversies created in terms of human gut microbiome uh, gut microbiome study further the therapeutics by large and uh, by and large are neither developed for not tested in diverse population that's one of the shortcomings and limitations of this uh, microbiome study the racial ethnic and socio economic inequality in subjects of human microbiome research threatens to perturbate this discipline in healthcare and we need to overcome that <clears throat> now the next part will be the human gut microbiome and enterotype when the uh, the human microbiome project first launched uh, on 2007 for nih when this uh, human microbiome project was started they were mostly focused on obviously westernized population it's not only from european uh, usa uh, population uh, they also targeted a large fraction of the european population and a very small amount of uh, population involved from the asia or africa so there was a big bias in terms of data they generated and obviously that leads to biasness in the interpretation now at 2011 this paper comes if you can see uh the enterotypes of human gut microbiome now what is a enterotype enterotype actually says that what will be the gut microbiome structure of your body and they are mostly and solely focused on the diet like if you are having a lot of animal protein based diet like if you eat only meat fish eggs and animal protein based food your gut will be dominated by this bacteria's multiple species but if you eat a lot of plant fiber based diet like uh, cabbage and all other plant material then your gut will be dominated by a different types of organism that's mostly purotella copri and there are uh, there is one more purotella species that's called purotella starkoria that was the this uh, conclusion first they drawn from this human microbiome data and that was done in 2011 after this paper there was a series of paper games that was that was your uh, controversies in human microbiome projects came into the picture there is a series of project where they actually oppose this view like there was one study where they said that linking long term dietary patterns with gut microbial enterotypes where they focus that no you cannot uh, made a clear cut distinction between human gut microbiome it is actually a continuous process and this continuous process varies obviously based on your diet or your long term dietary pattern but it has some uh, steps it's not a either or none rule there is one paper also came and that uh, this paper was published in science uh, it was back in 2014 now this paper came uh, where they said it's from the same group enterotypes in the landscape of gut microbial community composition here they also criticize the idea of differentiating gut microbiomes uh, in terms of two bacterial species the third paper also showed the same view Uh, they showed the same view that you cannot uh, differentiate gut microbiome based on only two bacterial species uh, as as i told you that the human microbiome project was hugely biased towards the westernized population and westernized population mostly rely on uh, this animal protein based diet obviously They, their gut microbiome is dominated by bacteria of multiple species but for non westernized like indian population chinese population and african population where people mostly uh, rely on the plant fiber based diet our gut microbiome is mostly dominated by purotella copri that was underrepresented in the sample that were 
there was a bias in the sampling and obviously that leads to certain controversies like what is the role of pivotella copy why this was uh, created this controversy was created because there was multiple papers where they showed through some association studies that pivotella copy is linked with two types of disease like one is type 2 diabetes like at the bottom one and another major one before which multiple papers came uh, that i guess i missed this one okay so i missed this one okay so there is a rheumatoid arthritis so multiple paper came where they tried to link pivotella copy with uh, either rheumatoid arthritis or type 2 diabetes now these papers came at the time at uh, 2011 to 2013 or 2014 where people does not focus on the metadata or they didn't give that much importance on the metadata like nowadays so obviously there was a bias in the sampling and obviously there is a lack of metadata present for all those metagenomic samples and this leads to further research on pivotella copy now after certain decades now think about the scenario on one hand people are saying the researchers are saying that your gut microbe the all the non westernized gut microbe is dominated by pivotella copy so and they are also saying that pivotella copy is responsible for type 2 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis there was obviously so many criticism that this cannot be possible or this cannot be the true picture otherwise uh they, then they tried to map that how many non westernized population has rheumatoid arthritis and type 2 diabetes obviously diabetes cases are high but the rheumatoid arthritis cases is far far actually lesser than the westernized population then their further research they did further research on this pivotella copy and this paper came where they showed uh, the genetic and functional traits of human intestinal pivotella copy strains are associated with different habitual diets now they give more importance or the metadata like they tried to classify all the gut metagenomes individually and tried to map the metadata and they tried to find out the what is the source of those metagenomes and they find out that pivotella copri is oh, sorry pivotella copri although it was identified as a single organism or i mean single species that actually a uh, big clades this uh, that's actually uh, consist of multiple clades or uh, multiple types or multiple traits and initially they tried to distribute this pivotella copri uh, based on the metadata into three categories like the people who are mostly the omnivores they eat both the uh, plant based and animal protein based uh, plant fiber based and animal protein based diet people who are vegetarians and people who are vegans and <clears throat> you can see from this curve that there is a um, if you see the left on the uh, figure a where they put both the vegetarians and vegans into a same group there is a clear two cluster form and in the b panel where they differentiate these vegetarians and vegans into separate clades you can see that pivotella copri has generated three clades so by this time this paper was published in 2019 march so by this time they could differentiate this pivotella copri into three different clades so people started to find out and start to dig more on this pivotella copri and is there any reason that they are related to this type 2 diabetes or uh, rheumatoid arthritis then next paper came from the same group where they found out that this pivotella copri complex actually comprised of four distinct clades it's not three it's actually four distinct clades and that was based on some phylogenetic studies which are underrepresented in westernized population mm. the and they find out that pivotella copri clade is distributed in four categories like clade a clade uh, the, uh, for this study they have actually used uh, multiple samples like total number of samples was uh, nearly 1500 and they also considered other studies and they clearly demonstrate that Pivotella copri is not a monotypic species. 
that was thought earlier but four clearly defined clades and each spanning a diversity that is typical of species like they proposed that this picopri but uh, uh, as this study was based on the metagenomic study they could not uh, differentiate the pivotella copri into multiple species so they just proposed or hypothesized and uh, they proposed to differentiate pivotella copri into four clusters and they said that all four clades have the potential to reside either solely or in combination within an individual and they proposed that p copri should be termed as a p copri complex comprising of clad a b c and d and the insights they gained that p copri complex is genetically and population wise related to genomics on isolated sequencing and sequencing individuals from underrepresented non westernized populations and largely on the tremendous resource of publicly available metagenomic data sets now covering multiple countries and multiple ethnic regions and finally they come to the conclusion that pivotella copri the among the four clades uh, this one represents the westernized population and this red population represent the non westernized populations now if you consider the four clades a b c and d this a and b clades are the most prevalent clades they are frequently present in westernized population as well like even if you are based on this uh, animal protein based diet your gut will be occupied by uh, i mean a uh, reliable fraction of uh, pivotella copri but when you are considering non westernized population all those four clades can co occur in the non westernized population as well so that might be one of the reason that for those i mean people thought that for those type 2 diabetes related uh, pivotella copri or rheumatoid arthritis related pivotella copri that's actually not the same clade but they couldn't find out in detail that what is the scenario will be for uh, this pivotella copri clades uh, then they try to uh, for this study they have used multiple samples like 6876874 6, public metagenomes and uh, from the previously available data genome that's why i i was saying that you need to put your data in perspective like you have to use the already published data along with your own data then only you can get the full picture the whole picture and they uh, among these 6874 publicly metagenomes there were many metagenomes which were uh, generated from the rheumatoid arthritis and type 2 diabetes related disease and they tried to find out uh, the association between those clades now uh, along with the uh, beta genomes from where they extracted the population genome bins they also performed the culture based studies and their four clade hypothesis was also supported uh, from this culture based or culture mix big studies if you see this one uh, if you see this uh, cladogram then the inner circle represents the clades like this one represents the clade b and yellow color represents the clad a so the clad a was most dominant so most number of isolates and most number of genomic bins was extracted from uh, uh, clad a clad a next big number was clad b and then clad c and clad d is the smallest one now next circle represents the presence of genomic bins in uh, type 2 related uh, in diff four different clads like each uh, bar represents a genomic bin or a population genome you can consider it as a picopri genome sorry you can consider it as a picopri genome and see their distribution like this type 2 related population genome bin or picopri genome is represented in all the four clades they also try to map that what is the marker of this lubia new both of these are rheumatoid arthritis related marker those specific genes will be there for all the rheumatoid arthritis cases and they are also distributed all over the four clades so basically they could not relate the uh, specific clade to either uh, type 2 diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis then they what they try to do is they try to 
uh, map the picopri genomes, the four clads, along with three more uh, genomes, like two from bacteroides. Bacteroides will supposed to dominate the animal protein diet based gut microbiome, and then uh, Fusilibacterium prosnis is one of the uh, one of the uh, organism which was equally dominated in both the picopri enterotype and also in the bacteroides enterotype. And they tried to map the uh, map their abundance, like they perform the read mapping onto those genomes and find out what is their frequency or uh, distribution in different cohorts. Like this is from Asian cohort, this is from Chinese cohorts. These two are uh, supposed to be dominated by picopri and the next one is the European cohort or the westernized cohort. But if you see their distribution, that uh, picopri, the first four bars represent the picopri. Uh, sorry, the uh, first six bars represent the picopri. And that was actually more or less equally dominant in Asian cohort and Chinese cohort. And obviously, this bacteroides is over dominant in uh, European cohort. But there was no clear correlation. Then they performed the life analysis that's the linear discriminant analysis where they try to find out the biological marker that can be related to the t2d the type 2 diabetes in uh, in asian population or european population like they perform this particular mapping in type 2 diabetes related uh, metagenomes and healthy metagenomes and from this study you can see that that rather than picopri that was earlier associated with the type 2 diabetes, this cream represents that higher abundance and this uh, LDS score actually shows that which is the, I mean, what is the organism that is positively correlated with the type 2 diabetes related situation. And from there, they find out that earlier there was a huge bias regarding the sample distribution. And that's why they did, I mean, they could not get a clear picture on the association of Pivotella copri with the healthy microbiome or with the disease related, the type 2 disease or rheumatoid arthritis related disease. Then uh, now I will give you an example where I will uh, show you that how you can relate your metagenomes and culture mix studies or the uh, metagenomes and beyond. This was termed as this uh, Clostridium difficile inhibiting gut commensals using culture mix. Uh, what was the actual target? That normal functioning of human gut required a balanced interaction between the mucosal surface that's present within our gut, the diet, and the microbiota, and obviously the byproducts that's coming out from the Micro, uh, metabolic by, uh, as a metabolic byproduct from the organisms. A major determinant of gut homeostasis is the presence of a healthy, diverse commensal microbiota, which prevents pathogenic bacteria from colonizing the gut or keeps their number below pathogenic level. Now, this function of the gut microbiome is called colonization resistance, where the normal gut microbiota prevents a pathogen from growing inside your gut. Now, perturbation in this gut microbiome, normal gut microbiota, referred to as the dysbiosis, that can result <clears throat> in a loss of uh, colonization resistance. Dysbiosis, that's the perturbation from the normal gut microbiota and loss of gut microbiota, colonization resistance caused by antibiotics. For example, that can predispose people to enteric infections like Clostridium difficile infection. The gut following antibiotic treatment is a clear demonstration of this phenomenon. When considering Clostridial difficile, which is a gram positive spore forming anaerobe that can leasing cause the antibiotic induced diarrhea in a hospitalized patient, the antibiotic treatment becomes very, very relevant. Antibiotic treatment of Clostridium difficile infection often causes recurrence, infusion of the fecal microbiome from a healthy person into a gut of a patient of with uh, Clostridium difficile infection can resolve Clostridium difficile infection and prevent recurrence. This procedure termed as FMT or fecal microbiota transplantation. Now, what is the problem of fecal microbiota transplantation is that you are transplanting with an unknown source like a, a fecal microbiome from a healthy donor. There could be millions of organisms and you 
you don't know whether there is any cytotoxicity present or whether there is any harmful pathogen present or not so um, has become a common treatment now however concerns were the same recently weight gain also and mortality have been reported as a result of transfer of multi drug resistant organism that's a big problem of users of fmt the development of a defined bacterial mix was the only alternative that are derived from the healthy microbiota which can resolve clostridium difficile infection may provide an alternative to fmt that was the target of this study to provide a healthy uh, known source of microbiota that can be replace the unknown fecal microbiome for the healthy uh, population for this one how we related this metagenomic study the compartment metagenomic study with uh, application based that first we did the metagenome sequencing of six samples and they we, they were uh, pivotella copri dominated enterotype and then we find out their distribution and then we tried to find out their presence in the six get uh, six gut microbiome for that we generated a pool sample and then uh, we perform the mapping of reads from uh, onto those isolated genomes other than this metagenomic uh, isolation and creation of population genome beams we also isolated several bacteria that was total 102 species and we find out that uh, using a mix approach like utilization of a single media in combination with different antibiotics we were able to isolate both the high abundance species this bar shows the abundance of this particular species in the pooled beta genome and if you can uh, see that we were able to isolate both the high abundance species as also the low abundance species we perform all the bio uh, phenotypic characterization and then we perform the clostridium difficile inhibition assay and we merge them uh, the result with uh, the metagenomic study how like there was a study the uh, I mean, we used publicly available metagenome where they used three defined cohorts or three defined groups one with clostridium difficile infection one with uh, where antibiotic was used and where antibiotic was not used and through this metagenome based study we were able to find out the abundance of those 15 uh, some strains the 15 strains like we isolated 117 uh, strains we performed the mapping of three defined cohorts onto those strains and we able to extract 15 strains that were highly abundant where antibiotic was not used and those strains were least abundant where clostridium infection was severe and they were having a moderate abundance where antibiotic was used uh, finally this study was concluded with bidirector assay where we performed a defined bacterial mix and then we performed the clostridium difficile inhibition assay in a bidirector that was a continuous culture and we were able to find out that this bar shows a mix of 15 strains this bar shows mix of 12 strains and this is the 10 strains and for each number we have actually randomly reduced or uh, removed one strain from the total mix and this strain shows that a mixture or a combination of eight bacterial strains can inhibit clostridium difficile so now you don't need to transplant the whole fecal microbiota from a, a healthy subject rather you can mix a known consortium of eight bacterial mixture for this fecal uh, fecal microbiota transplant or fmt based assay okay now i will discuss the low uh, what is the complexity of low diversity uh, metagenomes for this uh, i am what kind to working on the blood microbiome and the uh, current status of blood microbiome like people have published this kind of paper that whether this healthy human blood microbiome is it a fact or fiction so we need to come up with some uh, defined uh, met analysis pipeline so we have generated this pipeline for blood microbiome research in vector bone analysis where two things we focus mostly one is 
OTU count subtraction and removing the whole OTU count. Like along with your samples, you need to create sequencing reads for uh, your controls. Like you need to add a lot of controls in terms of positive control and negative control. Now in this SOP, in this pipeline, uh, we have given two options for the users. Like you can remove the whole OTU that is present in your control from the sample or you can subtract the OTU count that is present in your sample, uh, present in your control from the sample. And the next step will obviously be the control, use of control. This is the uh, positive control, like this graph shows a community standard, like we have used a positive uh, standardized community control from Zymo, where they have a listed uh, bacterial sources in a known uh, i mean known awareness or known frequency we have used three different targets from the sickness rna the v1 v2 v3 v4 and v4 v5 and we have measured that uh, how did our weight lab as well as the sop what we generated for this particular purpose work for this one if you see that for v4 uh, v5 targeted primer we could not uh, get or we could not explore all the communities that was present in the community standard. The best result we get for this V1, V2, for which we uh, we could recover not only all the bacteria that was present in the community standard, but to their exact amount as well. And then we performed another control study with the native control where we have used the negative controls and where we have used known target sequences, like we have mixed the bacterial uh, DNA in the canine blood in a known proportion. And we have tried to measure out the, what is the amount of background sequences we are getting from the uh, samples. The clear conclusion we could get that high background noise on low diversity samples, like this one, this is a comparison between two defined DNA preparation methods. Both of them almost work equally uh, with certain differences, but this is for one is to 10 dilution, this is for one is to 100, and this is for one is to 1000 dilution. This blue bar represents the target of interest. That means the DNA we have added to the canine blood and red bar, this is actually representing your uh, noise in the sequence or background diversity. If you see this graph, the trend is clear that whenever you have made a high dilution, then you are getting more noises. That means when your taxa of interest or when your target choice of in, uh, choice of DNA or choice of bacteria is present in less abundance in your sample, you will get more number of uh, background sequences or background noises. You have to be very careful with that one. Now, if you see this uh, beta diversity graph, which is based on the weighted unifrac, uh, and this is a PCO curve, you can see that although it has uh, generated two different uh, clusters, these are not statistically valid. So you cannot say that uh, you can, I mean, so you cannot differentiate between your target sequence and non-target sequence after you have obtained your OTU. So you have to be careful about that. Next one, or the next approach that could be, uh, that could you take for overcoming challenges to low diversity is thinking about alternative targets for vector bond pathogen. Like this is a entropy, uh, entropy graph. Entropy means you have to map your sequence, uh, you have to align your sequence first, and then you will calculate the Sanon entropy along the sequence. We have generated this one and compared with the 16S uh, two regions like V4, V5 and only the V4. If you see this graph, the entropy, the median entropy that is present ILES, the, what is uh, what entropy defines, that means your sequence will be more, I mean, you will get more number of different taxa if you consider ILES rather than considering this V4 and V5 region. That means uh, that means uh, when the question will come that at what identity level you should cluster your uh, OTU or cluster your sequence to generate OTU, you should think about considering other uh, genomic regions from the organism.
Okay, I'll be very specific here. Uh, now I will discuss some new concepts on the metagenomic study, like the concept I told you that to rarify or not to rarify, like what should be our approach. <clears throat> if you consider this graph, that to rarify, processing and analysis of amplicon sequencing data is statistically complicated for a number of reasons. Oh, sorry for a number of uh, reasons. For example, the library size, the, uh, that means the total number of sequencing reads within a sample that can vary widely among different samples. And even within a single sequencing run, that depends on your handwork. The disparity in library sizes between samples may not represent the actual differences in microbial communities. And that is why sequence counts cannot be compared directly among samples with variable sizes. That's one idea. For example, a sample with 5,000 sequences reads is easy, uh, likely to have a different read counts for a specific sequence variant than a sample with 20,000 sequencing reads, simply due to difference in library sizes. Now, in order to draw this biologically meaningful conclusion from amplicon sequencing data, samples must be normalized to remove artificial detection of variation between samples due to differences in library sizes. Because of that, a variety of normalization techniques that can affect the analysis and interpretation of results have been suggested. Now, rarefaction is one of such method where you can bring all the samples to the same level. Now, there are multiple process of rarefaction. If you see this graph, this one represents that repeated rarify to a small library size. This one A represents uh, to a rarefaction at 400 reads for every sample for 300, 200, and 100 sequence. And if you see this beta diversity, uh, this graph was generated with a simulated data set of six organisms, A, B, C, D, E, F. If you see the beta diversity at 400, 300, uh, I mean 400 and 300, then you can see that they are uh, clustering, uh, slowly becoming clustered together. But if you consider this graph where they rarified the sequences up to 500 sequence level for each uh, sequence or for each community, there is not much difference. So although rarefaction can, I mean, rarefaction can be confusing in terms of your analysis. That's the main message. Like, I mean, to what level you should rarify your data? That's the main question. If you are rarifying to a very nominal level, like 100 sequences, then you will not get separate clusters. So you you have to do multiple analysis with your data in terms of rarefaction. And the another thing you can say that rarifying with or without replacement, like there are multiple processes of rarifying. One is to do the replacement analysis and one is not uh, doing the replacement analysis. And that did not actually substantially impact the interpretation uh, using the break artist dissimilarity. And diversity analysis considered in this study, but rarifying without replacement will provide more accurate reflection of sample diversity. Now, people also argue that to avoid arbitrary loss of available information through rarefaction, a common library size, the random error introduced through rarefaction may be evaluated through repeated rarefaction multiple times. Like you need to do multiple rarefaction with your data and then perform analysis, uh, perform comparative analysis and generate your beta diversity map and then uh, check and then decide that to what level you should rarify your data. The use of larger normalized library sizes when rarifying minimizes the amount of artificial variation introduced into diversity analysis but may necessitate omission of samples with small library sizes. Or you can say that analysis at both uh, inclusive low library sizes and restrictive higher library sizes. Now, from this figure, it is clear that these are the ordination graph. The ordination patterns are relatively well preserved down to a small normalized library size with increasing variation shown by repeatedly rarifying Whereas uh, the fear is not shown, uh, they showed in the paper that the Shannon index is 
are very susceptible to being impacted by the small normal normalized library size, both in declining values and variability introduced through rarefaction. Finally, uh, even though you can see from this figure that even though repeated rarefaction can characterize the error introduced by excluding some uh, fraction of the sequence variants, rarifying like you can see from this figure that if you rarify till 500 sequences, there is not much difference for uh, without replacement or with replacement, the right image. And the, from the left image, you can see that if you go down till 100 sequences, you will get a clearly different result from what was the actual or the original figure. Like your all the groups or all the clusters of different species tends to merge together after rarefaction. That's true for, uh, again, this is, this is true for without replacement or with replacement studies. The next thing, I will be very brief on this one, the ASBs or ZOTUs concept. Like earlier we used to do uh, ZOTUs, uh, I mean, OTU clustering at 97% identity level because that was the biologically, uh, biologically uh, species, according to the biological species concept, 97% uh, cutoff is the cutoff for any species delineation. Now the idea is changing nowadays, like what should be the actual identity cutoff, like people are doing 95%, and then they came up with an idea that they should uh, utilize a 100% identity cutoff, but that's a different scenario. The figure, this figure shows that the x-axis represent all the biological variations available or exist at the sequenced genetic locus, like the all the uh, variations that is present for 16S RNA. And the y-axis represents all amplicon data generated from that locus that is using the 16S and all future data that may be generated. Like when you are utilizing, so what is the, the different methods for OTU generation or OTU picking? One can be the de novo OTU or open reference OTU where you do not map your sequences onto some databases and another can be the closed reference based OTU. That means where you map your sequences to certain database like the Silva, RDP, whatever it is, and then you generate OTU. What is the demarcation of this one? That for closed reference OTU, you cannot get any more new taxa or new OTU outside the, which is not present in the database. But for the de novo OTUs, if you are generating de novo OTUs, you cannot utilize all the sequences. The major problem will be to deal with the error rates. Now here comes the ASBs where they deal with both the, all the, I mean, both at the uh, closed reference OTU where they outperform the closed reference OTU in terms of taxa present or in terms of total diversity. And they also outperform the de novo OTUs in terms of total sequences available. Now, obviously, uh, this novel phenomena is under a microscope that what is the advantages and there are some advantages but although it's in very early days to uh, conclude or to comment on this one the some advantages you can say that we uh, using ASVs like where when you are using 100% OTU clustering level rather than utilizing 97% or 95% level you will get a lot more diversity so the first advantage will be uh, improved taxonomic resolution since 16S RNA sequence clustered at 97% sequence similarity level, that could effectively encompass defined microbial strains that may have diverged millions of years ago and have distinct phenotype on ecological attributes. So you can get a lot more diversity or a lot more uh, richness from your community when utilizing ASVs. The second one will be the, that's a kind of a contradictory one, the, ASVs or the ZOTUs, when we used an OTU based approach, there is not a single sequence for all member of that OTU. Instead, we pick the representative one sequence and that representative of a cloud of divergent sequence. So we merge multiple sequences to generate an OTU at 97% level or 95, whatever it is. By definition, when we use the ASVs or this ZOTU based approach, the sequence that is present within each ASV are identical to one another. And this has a couple of important ramifications. Like 
most notably this means that uh, defined data sets data sets are more readily compared against one another like if you are getting a more number of diversity from the same uh, uh, from a comparative community or from a comparative analysis using a contract community then you can get more diversity and one does not need to guess if a new sequence would be assigned to a pre existing otu the approach could be a direct one the comparison of asvs across studies is relatively straightforward and obviously it is computationally efficient the one problem is that you need to start uh, from the your sequence level in order to deal with the uh, read qualities for this asv generation and obviously there are more actually disadvantages of using asvs but still it's a growing area like too much diversity like if you are thinking about a otu generation at 100% identity level you will get at least three times more otu when it comes to microbial diversity i mean there are uh, there really can be too much of a good thing like for example an individual soil can harbor thousands of bacteria or fungal otus even when sequences are clustered at 97% identity level now think about a scenario when you are uh, clustering them at 100% identity level so what would be the uh, situation next will be the diverse genes in rrna operons like many bacterial and archaeal taxa that harbor multiple rna operons and even within a given genome the multiple rrna genes are rarely identified in fact 16s rna genes within a single genome are typically diverged by at least four base pairs with rrna gene dissimilarity increasing with increasing copy number like for some cases a single bacterial genome can contain 16s rna gene that differed by more than 40 base pairs like for fungal its the uh, internal translation uh, sequence analysis can also be affected by this intragenomic heterogeneity that's a major disadvantage of using asvs or jdotus the next uh, disadvantage you can say with the sensitivity to data quality like when you are using asvs uh, otu generation pipeline from the dada 2 then it's more sensitive to the quality values like you have to use almost q20 to q30 other will it will throw out most of the reads uh, i guess you guys have already done this and you have faced the problem of using dada 2 that it remove a lot more sequences in comparison to using a 97% identity level with uh, usearch or other softwares now although there is no general consensus like uh, then the obvious question will be what is the best one that's the problem with metagenomics there is no rule of thumb so you have to do multiple analysis and people try to get a general consensus on this one and they have come out with how it is like if your data is very very high quality and you want improved taxonomic resolution like you want to get the maximum richness possible from your community and you are not concerned about the intragenomic heterogeneity like you are not concerned that uh, you will uh, falsely represent a single species into two different one in the targeted market genes then asv can be one of your approaches and that can come out as an advantageous one otherwise obviously you have to go with more standard Uh, otus generation pipeline like with uh, 97% one like if you see this one then when utilizing dada 2 for asb and u noise 2 that means uh, it's also the same uh, uh, same concept but they turn the z otus uh, from um, they turn the z otus but this u noise 2 is coming from the u search pipeline this dada 2 is a different pipeline there is not much difference when you are comparing this u uh, u noise 2 and u parts u parts actually they have used 97% identity level so this is this dada 2 is coming from a different pipeline but if you are considering a similar pipeline that u search and comparing otus generation at 100% level that means z otus and otus that has been generated at 97% level that's with u parts basically there is no difference in terms of richness so obviously your result will also depend on the actual diversity that is present within the community uh i guess everyone is still with me i mean you guys are i cannot see your face so i don't know how much 
it become burden for you so these are the things i promise that i will give you this few resources which you can use for your analysis like these are the things i faced during my phd and still nowadays i face a lot of limitations in terms of computational power help pages and all those things you can go through this one uh, this university of chicago has a very good help page from this marine lab and they have uh, dedicated sites dedicated pages where you can go through the softwares they are utilizing they from this page you can download your data then compare different pipelines you can perform benchmarkings you can go through their sops and what is the current trend and all those things obviously you all have already used the galaxy portal so galax what is the biggest benefit of galaxy portal like galaxy at least i know about three portal like one the us the dot org one is dot eu galaxy use galaxy dot eu that's the name actually and you will get 250 gb of data for each of these sites you can upload the sequences you can perform the analysis in galaxy itself and also you can install galaxy in your laptop and you can run the pipeline you want to the third one is a very helpful one i have found out that's from a happily really, uh, bioinformatics that's i guess from university of california from where you can learn about several unix commands linux commands you can practice them you can go through their r portal they have uh, dedicated sops and dedicated all those analysis tutorials they have help pages and obviously you can mail them and obviously you can work with the genomics uh, genomic pipelines if you have some problem and this one i will not go much detail but for the nih human microbiome project is important in terms of the fact that they have a huge data so if you want to now work with human metagenome data this is the best site to go you can go there you can download the data from sra and if you want to work with only human gut metagenome project then hmp is the site but if you want to work with uh, data from other body sites then go to the hmp to the hmp the right side one uh, those people who are working with ocean metagenomes or data from ocean or environmental shape they can go to this page the tara ocean metagenome project they are they also have dedicated uh, sites for data download they have clear cut sops what are the uh, parameters you should use what are the primers you should use how you should prepare dna because there is a lot of inhibitors present in environmental dna so how to remove those inhibitors you will get a very good idea about all those things and obviously you know about the arc microbiome project where they use those variable ones so i will not go much detail and obviously you can go to the github and this is the site to ask your to ask all your questions like sequence form there is another one the sequence answer so you can ask whatever questions you have in your mind and obviously you will get some answer you can ask for tools you can ask for any specific ideas you can discuss ideas and other than ncbi this is also in parallel on the ebi metagenomics from here you can also download your data and you can also uh, discuss your ideas you can also be updated on the development of metagenomics field and all those things okay so i finished my talk here so i would like to acknowledge myself president sir and this figure was taken from my last uh, expedition to ladakh that was back in uh, 2016 uh, i want to thank professor yadav gupta bosi sir for this sir obviously on the sir for <laughs> with those data excuse me sir <clears throat> sorry sir so this is vikas okay. sir doctor doctor ocean doctor ocean is your colleague yeah he was with me in, in south dakota state university he left last year yeah okay sir so actually he was my professor in bachelors oh okay that's nice sir actually yeah. uh, he is out of contact and i am and i am a bioinformatics discipline so i would like to contact him if you have any contact of him yeah i mean i have his number we we'll talk a little so i will uh, tell him about you okay so you can mail me or you can message me after this talk right okay thank you so much sir sure no problem yes uh, dr roy uh, so you can finish your yeah. presentation yes yes i'm um, done okay so dr roy thank you for your presentation and uh, that was a very interesting talk i must say and uh, i'd like to thank you for taking time off from your busy schedule and for joining us uh, with this webinar 
So, we will now move to the question answer session and uh, 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 I always I already told you that if you have some question you can put them in the chat section. Dr. Roy can you see there are some questions in the chat section. So I cannot see where is the chat section. Uh, on the right side before the people can you see the chat section. I am not sure if you can see the chat section. So uh, maybe I can read some of the chats for you or uh, oh. Or maybe uh, you can directly ask also, you can uh, turn on your mics and you can ask your question one by one. There is one question from Swati Rulon. If she is online, can, can you ask Swati? Uh, yes, ma'am. One of the girls, uh, sir, has mentioned IAS and V4 and V5. So I wanted to ask from sir that what is that? Can you please repeat your question? There is some background noise. Uh, sir, uh, yes, sir. Yes, now I can hear you. Yes, Swati. You can ask your question. Yes, sir. Should I repeat it for uh, Dr. Roy? Uh, sir, I wanted to ask uh, that in one of the slides you have discussed about uh, one uh, table. Uh, that was showing ILES and uh, V4 and V5. So I yes. wanted to ask that what was that? Yes, sir. Oh. Slide. Sorry, just a moment. Can you see my slides now? Just a moment. Maybe I have to pin it. No, it's not. The slides are not visible. Is it visible now? Uh, yes, I think it's. Yes, sir. Okay, so your question is about this one, right? Yes. Yeah. So as I told you that uh, yes. how, I mean, uh, this was in the perspective that how to uh, overcome the low diversity matrix, you know, like we were dealing with some samples for which uh, the number of 16S sequences is very low and the association between different species is very close that even at 100% identity level for ASBs, you cannot differentiate between two species from uh, 16S RNA region. Like if you have done 16S sequencing for two vector one pathogen, like sub, suppose think about anaplasma is a vector one pathogen belongs to the alpha protein bacteria. You are thinking about anaplasma of phagocytophilum and some anaplasma platys. If you compare their 16S, you will, you will not be able to differentiate those two anaplasma using 16S RNA, even at the full 16S level. Just forget about V4, V5, which is a uh, so, uh, shorter than the 16S. So you have to come up with some other sequences or target genes. That's why we have targeted one of the genes. So we have done this entropy analysis, like how this has been done. Like first, we selected those genes which are global in terms of uh, presence in the genomes. We selected the core genomes and performed the alignment of all the core genomes. Then if you go through the alignment, you can generate the syntropy, uh, the syntropy plot, the, uh, the, sorry, the entropy plot using Sanon criteria. Like suppose your sequence is 1600 base pair. So you will get an entropy for each of your base. Now you can put this uh, whole entropy plot or you can plot this whole uh, entropy into a plot like this one you can plot a, uh, you can plot it in box plot and you can check the medium but this has some certain advantages that will take some time and when we compare this ILES sequence and we have also analyzed other genes like this is DNA X, RDTA, RPLU these are multiple genes but these are mostly most importantly these are core genes so they are present in all the bacterial genomes most likely and the differentiation, the tentative differentiation possible from these genes is actually much higher than the 
V4, V5 or the whole 16S region. Is it clear to you now? Swati, is it clear to you? Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so there is another question from Shubhajit Sen. Shubhajit, are you present? You can ask your question. Okay, uh, maybe I can repeat the question. Uh, Shubhajit has asked, can you please explain uh, the help of Shannon index? Shannon index, how can we analyze our metagenome data? I think he has tried to ask Shannon. about the Shannon index. Oh, Shannon. Oh, I cannot see that. He has asked yes. about both Shannon and Simpson, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Shannon and Simpson both, right? Uh, yeah, I can understand. Yeah, great. So, Shannon, Shannon index and Simpson index are different. I mean, Shannon index is a OTU richness index. Like, uh, what is the total diversity or what is the richness of your data set? If you compare the Shannon index from two different metagenomes, you can say that what is the richness, I mean, for which sample you have higher richness, that means the number of diversity will be more. And with the Simpson index, you can compare the evenness. Like, uh, think about a, a scenario, like if you are considering Simpson index or evenness index, uh, in a community, there are 10 species, in a comparative community, there are also 10 species. So the Shannon index is supposed to show you the same one. There, there will be no difference. But if you consider the Simpson, now the uh, among those 10 species, the abundance of one species is 50. And the abundance of other species, the total nine species is 50. So you are getting total 100 reads distributed in 10 sequences. And for another comparative community, where suppose uh, each year each of the 10 species is consisted of 10 sequencing reads so your evenness will be much higher for the uh, community where your sequences or where your organisms are evenly distributed so by using shannon index you can compare the richness of, of two communities and by using simpson index you can compare the evenness or the distribution of the species within the community. Okay. So there is another question from Vikas Kumar. Uh, sir, what aspect do you consider before taking the sample for the retrieval of microbes from the location or site? What aspects do we consider before taking the sample? Aspects. Okay. Aspects should be lead by, uh, I mean, should be dictated uh, by your study. But if you want to think from the microbiological point of view, obviously it has to be, I mean, this question is not actually clear to me, but I still try to answer this one. Uh, that if you are uh, thinking about some environmental sampling, then you must think about anthropogenic activities. You must think about aseptical collection of those ones. You must think about measuring all the environmental parameters uh, while collecting your samples. like temperature or pH. But if you are considering uh, human samples, they, then there are uh, certain other parameters. Obviously, that should you follow while collecting your samples. But if uh, he can explain the question, then maybe I can answer it in a better way. Uh, Vivek, are you there? You can ask him directly then. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Sir, actually, actually, I was I was uh, from the point of view of my, as a microbiologist uh, or a microbiology student. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, I have, sec uh, I'm in second year in the final semester. I have to do a dissertation, so that is why I was asking for the wet lab methodology. No problem. Go ahead. You can ask a question. So, sir, uh, like, uh, sir. Uh, I have topic cyanobacteria, and I have to uh, retrieve. Uh, and I have to retrieve cyanobacteria from a site. So, sir, uh, then I have to go through these studies about cyanobacteria. Like, yeah, please. I mean, what is your target? To do the metagenome sequencing or to do the culture? Culture. Uh, still, I'm still with uh, culture, not uh, sequencing or. Uh, so like for culture, you need to be more cautious because otherwise, uh, I mean, you need to make a viable, uh, maintain a viable condition. Like for the culturing, actually, what we have done, we filtered the uh, water and put it in a glycerol stock. 
so i cannot tell you exactly what is the procedure for cyanobacterial culturing i'm sorry i mean but the thing is that you need to maintain a very viable condition like uh, putting it in the dry ice but if you put it in dry ice maybe you need to uh, you need to put it in uh, glycerol as well so um i'm sorry i cannot answer you exactly that what is the conditions you should maintain while collecting cyanobacteria sir so glycerol is uh, glycerol is stock prefer uh, preferable yeah but if you put it in glycerol stock you must put it in the liquid nitrogen or uh, uh, dry ice otherwise it will act as a, uh, i mean it will be cytotoxic to the cells okay sir yes sir thank you sir I think because this is all I have. have uh, you can ask a question to uh, more uh, specifically to person who deals with the microbiology part. So basically, we are more on the metagenomics. So maybe a person okay. who is more into culturing, he will better answer. That. So we have. Uh, achha, moving okay, on, uh, okay, if sorry. you have many more question, you can ask directly. I would request our guest uh, if they have any questions, uh, they can uh, uh, ask uh, him, Professor Chakraborty, or maybe Professor Ghosh can ask uh, any question if they have uh, to Dr. Chan. Professor Chakraborty, can you hear me? Sir? Yes, I can. I yes, can. yes, yes. So, sir, so if you have any question for Chan. Maybe you can ask. No, I will talk with, no, I will talk with Chuan later because we are running out of <laughs> yes, time and yes, we have yes. another speaker to you know. Yes. So yes. it will be nice. We take few questions after Ridhiman Ghoshan. Yes, talk. yes, that will be very nice. So uh, moving on, yes. So our uh, next speaker we have uh, uh, is uh, Professor Ridhiman Ghosh, Dr. Ridhiman Ghosh, and he is uh, associate professor in Department of Microbiology. Bose Institute, Calcutta. It's my privilege to welcome you, sir, uh, for this uh, webinar. So uh, I'm very a small person to introduce uh, you in front of uh, the people, but I'll try my level best. So uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Ghosh has uh, completed his PhD under the guidance of uh, great Dr. Pradosh Rai in uh, Bose Institute. And uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh uh, is a very well-known uh, Meta, uh, metagenomics uh, research person. He has uh, published many important uh, research papers in reputed journals like uh, Fence Microbiology Reviews, Geomicrobiology, and his current focus is uh, dealing with the extreme environments, the uh, microbial, uh, uh, microbial communities present in extreme uh, habitats like the hot spring systems of Trans Himalayas and the sediments of Arabian Sea oxygen uh, zones. So today he will uh, give his lecture on metagenomics in the discovery of cryptic biogeochemical processes and which is based on his work on geomicrobiological exploration of the uh, Arabian Sea sediments. So, sir, if you can uh, take over the screen and present your uh, talk for, before us. Okay, I, I wish everybody a very good afternoon. And, and I, I take the, uh, I will say, the permission of the house to waste some uh, few minutes because I am not adept to, you know, presenting the screens. I am trying it out. So if there are some glitches, just, uh, you know, bear with me for a couple of uh, minutes, if not seconds. So I'm trying it out, uh, how to do that. So, yeah. So. Yes, sir, I think. How to, uh, yeah. how to do that, I, yes, sir, I believe. It was present, I think. You can again share your screen, maybe. So I share my screen. Start now. So how how actually how to do this? And this is the issue which comes up. You know, every time I try to do this, I can't do that. Uh, well, uh, if if uh, am I am I visible? So your slide is not visible yet. You can present uh, your slide again.
this is one problem I face every time I am here for a webinar. And maybe if I if I don't succeed in a couple of uh, few tens of seconds, then I'll I'll hand it over to yes. Professor Tagore. Yes. Then I can uh, I have your slides uh, and then I can present them. Uh, I believe we I believe we should not waste much time because uh, you know. Okay, sir. Uh, then I'll, I'll I'll start uh, uh, your slide presentation and then you can maybe give your. Yeah. Advice to that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer. That will be better, I believe. Just a moment and try. Yeah, I believe you are here. Yes, sir. Just a moment. I'll just begin the slide yeah. presentation. Yes. So am I... Yeah. Uh, I can see the slides, yeah. Yes. But the troublesome affair is that I can't control it <laughs> anyway. Yes, so, that uh, That will be the problem. So... Uh, just a moment, sir. Yes. Hey, can you see the slides? Yeah, I can see the slides. Okay, so then you can sir, begin then. I will change it when you require. Yeah, uh, so uh, as has always been the equation with me and my students, uh, including Chan. So uh, my task is always to make the story building after all the scientific works have been done. So Chan has, uh, you know, set up the day with highly informative lecture on how to execute the science, how to really process the data and do the analysis. And, and then after all, uh, the, the entire uh, bottleneck, you know, ends at the buck air stops at my end. That means I have to do some story building back in our lab. So I will share with you a couple of stories. Sir, just you know. a moment. Uh, sir, there is some problem with the YouTube streaming. Maybe just give me a few more seconds so that. Uh, yeah, you can you can carry on on your part, and, yes. and 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 meanwhile I can just you know set the context yeah, sir, of the yes, lecture. Sir, just a moment, sir. Yeah, the context of the lecture goes like this: uh, that uh, you know we were uh, working with uh, sulfur oxidizing bacteria as always, and sulfur oxidizing bacteria, you know, are the chemolithotrophic bacteria which use sulfur compounds as their energy and electron sources. And at that point of time, we were uh, working on the pathways of sulfur oxidizing bacteria as well as their evolution, and also trying to know the adaptations of sulfur oxidizing bacteria as well as the carbon sulfur cycle in the hot springs of the Trans Himalayas. And as the next slide will come up, you will get to see, yeah, here it is. So it is actually a twist of a sulfur biologist uh, group uh, with an area which was not uh, actually ours. So it, 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 it is a, a domain which is a preserve of the oceanographers. And we being terrestrial microbiologists, we had no access or exposure to all these things. So as the slide proceeds, you will see uh, that we were working at that point of time with the people at the National Institute of Oceanography in Goa. And Dr. Aninda Mazumdar was my collaborator there at that point of time. And the bridge between us were the sulfur isotopes. So what he was essentially helping us out with was the fractionation studies and the stable, stable sulfur isotope ratios in our pure culture samples as well as our environmental samples obtained from the hot springs. So while we were working on these problems way back in 2010, 2009, and, and those were another, you know, uh, part of our research. 
and sometime later on we can delve into those uh, and if the next slide comes up then i'll be able to present the thing in a better way yes sir uh, professor uh, dakur is, is yes, the presentation sir. ready yes sir just a moment then the next slide yeah yeah yes sir so you can put it in the yes it's uh, slide is it visible board. for yeah. you sir yeah is it yeah visible? it is visible to me you can okay. put it in the slide yeah, show yeah, yeah. mode yeah it's there sir it's here there you can So you can you can start uh, giving your talk, sir. Yeah, but uh, you put it in the slideshow mode. Okay, just a moment, sir. So yeah, visible? here we are. Yeah. Yes, here we are. So you know, way back, so when you can see that uh, Anindra was having much more hair on his head, and I was also having a little bit more hair on my head. That was ten years back. when the sulfur isotopes and their fractionation studies were the bridge between us and you can see that onindoda is on board uh, a research vessel out in the sea and i was there in the hot springs and and this is this is a uh, you know a small cartoon showing um, the science in the hot spring sulfur cycle and i'll not go into that but uh, there were important findings going on at that point of our uh, collaboration and as the slide proceed you can see that uh, uh, we also did the fractionation behavior during the sulfur oxidation pathways during the various metabolic processes in the laboratory cultures as well as as well as uh, in the sulfur cycles in the hot springs so at that point of time uh, dr mazumdar asked me that why don't you uh, uh, professor thakur you can carry on with the slides a little bit and and as it proceeds yes these are some of the papers that came up you can go to the next slide and there is another paper regarding the hot springs yes this is so the these are the things that were going on and in the next part of this slide is telling you see that he said that rithiman uh, you have been doing this sulfur studies uh, here and there and and why don't you lay your hands on our missions and programs uh, in the arabian sea oxygen minimum zone and i was uh, totally you know unaware of all these things uh, regarding the oceanographic uh, uh, terminologies and i said what was oxygen minimum zone and as the next slide comes up you will see that uh, it's a simple cartoon of the oxygen minimum zone it is in the uh, northern part of the indian ocean where you can see the shaded portion it is a mid oceanic territory you know starting from a water depth of 100 meters and extending up to a water depth of approximately 1200 meters where there the water becomes hypoxic there are various reasons for this hypoxia overall this hypoxia is perennial it remains uh, you know like that around the year importantly in the next slide you will see that the basic reasons are that where the ocean current hits a dead end that means in the land locked portions of the global ocean as is the case in uh, the northern arabian sea in this global map you can see the deeply blue shaded portions they represent the oxygen minimum zones where the ocean current is hitting the continental shelf and there is no further circulation and then what happens is that with increasing water depth the oxygen in the photic zone you know gets uh, utilized by high productivity and further biodegradation and then what happens is that uh, a mid oceanic hypoxic zone appears because high biodegradation activity and high productivity utilizes whatever oxygen is there within a few tens of at best up to 100 meters water depth and then the water becomes perennially hypoxic then why again the water becomes oxic beyond a water depth of 1200 meters in the continental slope region is because of upwelling the cold oxygenated waters from the southern ocean they are upwelled seasonally and that upwelling then creates another oxic line starting from 1200 meters uh, you know below the sea level and further deep so this mid oceanic oxygen minimum zone or this mid oceanic hypoxia remains afloat around the year and through you know the current geological ages and interestingly the continental shelf and slope sediments that are impinged by this hypoxic water those sediments are of 
high biogeochemical interest. Now, he said that why don't you people, you know, come on board with us and explore the carbon sulfur cycle and the processes of sulfur oxidation, sulfate reduction and all those things. Then it was a very sketchy idea, as is true with all the CPN sciences. And this part of the ocean really was uh, unexplored as compared to the other oxygen minimum zones. As you can see from the just from the previous slide, that the 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 rest of the oxygen minimum zones, which are located in the western coast of the Americas, in the eastern Pacific, and in the eastern coast of Atlantic, that means on the west coast of Afri Africa in the Namibian region, in the Namibian coast, in the Peru-Chile coast, you can see there are, you know, intense oxygen minimum zones, uh, the blue territories which you can see out there. So those are relatively better studied in terms of uh, the sediment biogeochemistry. But the one, the counterpart in our part of the global ocean, that means in the Arabian Sea, and in the northern, that is in the northern part of the Indian Ocean, there the sediment biogeochemistry is, is relatively less explored. So the program started and we conducted a cruise sometimes in, you know, early in part of uh, the bygone decade. In 2011-12, the, the cruises were con conducted, we took the samples, it was a hectic exercise, you can see some of the snapshots of that uh, enormous, uh, I will say, 12-day rigorous uh, expedition. In total, we took, you know, 10 sediment cores, each were three meter long. And, and and in the next slide, you will be able to see the localization of those cores with respect to the Western Indian continental shelf and the continental slope. You can see the location of all these 10 cores. You can see their numbers out in the x-axis. As you can see that the core number one and the core number nine and 10, they are you know, not exactly within the oxygen minimum zone. That means uh, they are not impinged by the oxygen minimum zone waters. Core number one is where the bottom oxic line again comes into play. So uh, this is where the sediment is impinged by a three tire, you know, oxygen zone. One is the bottom oxic line, then the oxygen minimum zone, and then the upper oxic line. In core number nine and 10, you can see that the water is impinged by oxygenic waters, which remain largely oxic in most part of the year. Will, if, if time permits, I can come back to those cores or the water column lying above the nine and 10 cores. They also suffer from some kind of hypoxia and that's a seasonal hypoxia. And that's not the perennial one. So nine and 10 is another physiography. And from two to eight, you can see from core number two to eight, uh, the water is, uh, that water that is impinging the uh, sediment is absolutely a hypoxic one. And and various depths of or various thickness of upper oxic line lies above that. So such is the scenario. So uh, uh, just from the previous slide, we uh, you can see that we brought in the samples and, and the boys were up to their task. And at, at the beginning, somebody, you know, likes to everybody or, or most of us like to, you know, put our acknowledgements. And I will also put up a formal acknowledgement at the end of the lecture. But even before the lecture can start, I believe I have to tell you uh, something about my army of boys. And incidentally, and unfortunately, in this picture, Chayan does not figure out. Uh, because uh, actually when this figure was taken, you can already see that I, I had grown white beards and Chuan had left the lab for the U.S. But uh, this team also, plus Chuan, you add uh, Chuan into, the, into this. And this is, uh, you know, my team, which was really up to the task. And uh, uh, had it not been for uh, this wonderful team, you know, you can imagine that all these cores are uh, three meter each. And they were sampled from the other slide. You can see that they were sampled at a resolution of uh, 15 to 25, 30 centimeters. So on an average, uh, you get uh, something like 10, 15, and in some cores, even 20 samples. So if there are 10 cores and 15 on an average, 15 samples uh, per core, then we were actually staring at 150 data points across the sea floor. So 150 data points in two dimensions. One is in the vertical dimension and one is obviously along a water depth transit. 
So such is the scenario of the entire uh, data set that we were working with. So at the beginning of the entire story, I'm, I'm here, as I told you, to tell you about the story building of the science, about what really, what, uh, what message or, or what saga ultimately is revealed after this entire rigorous you know, exercise of metagenomics and, and culture independent exploration. And here we are backing it up with some amount of culture dependent uh, experimentation, as well as very, very robust geochemistry data from our collaborators, counter, you know, laboratory. So it was, it was a daunting task at, at the very beginning. And most importantly, one should understand that when we were starting all these things, it was a sort of a serendipitous exercise because we also did not exactly know what we were looking at. And, and we repeatedly faced this question. Uh, I also went to the Ministry of Arts Science at some point of time in 12, 13, you know, uh, in 2013 for some little bit of funding. Then they said, why do you want to explore this? I said, uh, because the biogeochemistry and the carbon sulfur cycling in this part of the global ocean and particularly the Arabian Sea OMZ, as compared to the other global OMZ, uh, these are less explored and the world knows little about them. Then say they, they said that there are so many unexplored parts. Why do you really want to explore them? Then I, I, I was at pain to explain that if we are exploring some new place and if the new place, you know, has some, I'll say, some geological peculiarity and if the person or the groups are also new, that means they bring in some new vision or way of looking at things then you can expect some new discoveries too. So that's the logic uh, as of then. That was the logic <laughs> at that point of time. So starting from there, I can just classify our entire uh, gamut of findings into these four headings. These are not, I will, the purpose is, I mean, the purpose is not to showcase the publications. They are very modest and, and very, I will say ordinary publications, but the storylines are important and they are really interesting if you look at them. So I, I have arranged these uh, from left to clockwise according to their, uh, you know, their chronology. But I will, I will try to, uh, you know, go according to their chronology and try to come to the most sensational discoveries and, and be on the watch out for this finding. The famous microbiology letters paper, where you can see that the title itself is quite interesting, aerobic bacterial communities in the sediments of a marine oxygen minimum zone. So as you could already guess, or as you have already seen, that the overlying water column is hypoxic perennially. And, and the background data or the background knowledge already says that the sediment itself is likely to be you know, anoxic because the productivity is high. And since the productivity is high, the transport of labile organic matter to the sea floor is also going to be very high. And when that happens, and when already at the water sediment interface, you have very little oxygen, large amount of that oxygen or most of that oxygen is likely to be consumed within few centimeters of sediment depth. So this is itself uh, quite interesting at the very outset. And then there are other stories also about the cryptic role of tetracyanate in the sulfur cycle of uh, marine sediments. This also sounds interesting, but not obviously not as interesting as this one. And to start with, I have to set up the story. To start with, you have to go into the scientific reports paper which I'll have to resort to, I'll have to, you know, fall back to this paper. It came up first. It is the, uh, the oldest one. By chronology, it was the first paper to appear, and the entire stage is set by that paper. So I'll use that paper, the scientific reports one, Enhanced Carbon Sulfur Cycling at the OMZ Center. I'll use that paper to set the stage. Then I'll skip this sulfur cycling business, the cryptic role of tetrathanate, where you can easily presume that, uh, I mean, the tetrathanate itself was not detectable. We didn't detect tetrathanate, but there were metagenomic evidences, ample metagenomic and metatranscriptomic evidences to suggest that tetrathanate indeed was an important junction in the sulfur cycle of these sediments. And I'll, I'll skip that story. 
and I'll come up and take this aerobic bacteria in OMZ sediments. And, and, and to be diplomatic, actually, I, have, I had to suppress that aerobic bacterial communities in anoxic sediments. I, 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 when I tried to go, you know, firing on all cylinders and kept the title like that, aerobic bacteria in anoxic sulfidic sediments, then the world was finding it very difficult to digest, and that too from you know big talks from small mouths, given our low credentials in oceanographic biogeochemistry. So we had to tone down a bit and, and tackle it in this way, aerobic bacterial communities in oxygen minimum zone sediments. So that sounds you know less idiosyncratic. So to make it sound less idiosyncratic, we did away with the terminology anoxic sulfidic sediments. And finally, if time permits, if time permits, I believe it won't, I will take up a larger panorama where we really try to compare all 10 cores. In the first paper, in the scientific reports one, you will see that all eight cores are compared. So it is a, it is a daunting task. Eight cores, each having a depth dimension, and also they themselves are arranged in a water depth transit dimension. So you have a two dimensional data. And then within each data point, there are variations. So, so the dimensions become innumerable. Then if time permits, I'll take up this bio RxIV data where we will try to again, you know, give you a picture of the biogeochemistry along the entire continental margin. So I, I, I mean, uh, that I believe I won't be able to do at this point of time today. So anyway, to, start, to set up the science, I, I'm showing here certain data from that scientific reports paper where you can see at the very left-hand corner. This is the 16 rRNA gene sequence-based, I mean, uh, precisely the V3 sequence-based diversity data. Here you are looking at the phylum level classification. You can, you can presume that each block represents uh, a core. We are only showing six of them. And the phyla are represented by various colors. And you can see the enormity of data points. So many of them are there. So don't go into the details. I'm going to go into the second slide. I, I, will, I will sum up, obviously. Ultimately, the take home message is important. No, I'll just go back to the previous slide. And, and the next right hand corner, I'll come down one by one cyclically. In the previous slide, where, you, where I showed, yeah, yeah, in this slide, where you can see uh, the diversity data. Just after that, you can see the down depth fluctuation of the diversity of sulfate reducing bacteria. Down in the right hand bottom corner, there is the sulfate and sulfide profiles. You can see that the sulfate profile is going down with sediment depth in all the cores, as is expected in any textbook of sediment biogeochemistry, the sulfate concentration is going down. Sulfide, you can see, interestingly, is appearing, free sulfide is appearing from the core number six, I mean, core number five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, uh, don't go ahead. Please go back to the previous slide. So another interesting thing you can see is that in core number six, in core number six, you can see free methane appearing in the bottom of the sediment. That means the sulfate methane transition zone is detected or has shallowed up, upward up the sediment depth only in this particular core in, in SSK 42 by 6. And the last, last panel, the left hand bottom panel, the left hand side bottom panel, this is a very interesting piece of data, although not related to metagenomics, but it will be very important. To, to really, uh, uh, you know, frame the entire story. I'll just, you know, uh, tell you in, in a nutshell that it essentially shows it is the geochemical evidence of the shallowing of the SMTZ. Essentially, you can see that this, this involves a TOC curve, the total organic carbon curve, which is the solid black circle, and an open black circle that shows the delta 13C ratio I mean, the, the, the 13C isotopic ratio of the DIC, the dissolved inorganic carbon, and the blue curve, the blue symbol curve, it shows the delta 13C values of the TOC, that means the organic carbon. You can see that the delta 13C ratio, I mean, the isotope ratio of the TOC is not changing down there. Interestingly, the delta 13C DIC, the, the, the inorganic carbon, Delta 13C ratio 
initially you see the curve it is initially on the right hand side of the delta 13c poc curve but when you come to the core number 5 6 7 you see that the curve is crossing the delta 13c poc curve and going to your left hand side that means it is getting that means the, the, the fractionation values are depleting of 13c more and more again in 8 you can see that the delta 13c dic curve has again gone back to the right hand side of the delta 13c toc curve so this essentially tells you that there is a shallowing of the sulfate methane transition zone in the center of the omz at the heart of the omz this core number 5 6 and 7 they are located at the middle point of the omz if you go back to the picture which i initially showed once again if you go back you will see that 1 2 3 these are on one flank of the omz 7 and 8 they are on another flank of the omz core number 5 and 6 are at the heart of the omz if now we go to the second picture you can see this is the summation of the entire story this model is very interesting where you can see that the cores are all plotted in the next slide please in in in, in this slide you can see that all the cores are being represented by each data point the shaded area is the omz area right the 200 meter water depth is where from the omz is starting at that point of our exploration at that point of time when the exploration was made the uh, the omz was occurring at around a water depth it was starting at a, at a, at a water depth of around 200 meters and it was extending uh, uh, somewhere around up to 1200 meters so here you can see that each point is being represented by the summation of the cores by geochemical data you can see the average diversity you can see the average toc for each point essentially what you can also see you can see the the cores each cores depth integrated sulfate reduction rate all these parameters also you can see the the water depth the, the red curve the bottom water oxygen concentration and also the average o2 count for the sulfate reducing bacteria what you can see at the end of this entire exercise is that at the heart of the omz you can see around in in the next right hand panel as well as in the left hand panel you can see that at around 580 meters below the sea level or at around 600 meters below the sea level in these two cores core number processes are at their maxima the toc average toc wet percentage for the core is also highest the sulfate reduction rate for the core is highest the overall microbial diversity in terms of the o2 count it is at its you know maxima with respect to the other six cores seven cores i mean five and six with respect to the other six cores they are having overall higher o2 count and also o2 count for the sulfate reducing bacteria are also highest and if you club the shallowing of o omz data that means the methane was also there only in core number 6 and the dic you know the delta 13c dic value also said that the dic is not only coming from organic matter by degradation or the remineralization of organic matter the dic is also coming from methanoclastic sulfate reduction that means anaerobic methane oxidation which is a property of the smds in the sulfate methane transition zone that is also happening in only those cores which are at the center of the omz so the center of the omz is the region where the carbon sulfur cycle is at its highest that is at its peak the entire processes are heightened they are enhanced in this central region where where at a water depth of 580 to 600 meters below the sea level the most intensely hypoxic waters are impinging the sediments whereas with the rise of oxygen bottom water oxygen you can see in 7 and 8 slowly you can see there is a drop in the sulfate reduction rate there is there is a drop in the diversity of both overall you know microorganismal diversity as well as the diversity of sulfate reducing bacteria so is also true in case of the toc that means the toc content is also going down in the core so this was the basic finding and it was obviously a a, a stepping stone into the biogeochemistry uh, exploration so moving ahead from here
we started looking i'm, I'm not going to because uh, this is not something which is cryptic and i have pledged that i will talk to you about something which is cryptic so this was uh, the entire panoramic biogeochemical scenario of this region next we if you go into the next slide i mean before going into the next slide we looked at the otu data we, we very carefully started looking at the otu data and it was also another case of serendipity and i must correlate at that point of time as i, I started with the hot spring sciences where chayan was working very intensely so there our main finding was also an idiosyncratic issue that the hot springs of the trans himalayas the sulfur boron hot springs they were inhabited mostly by relatives phylogenetic relatives of mesophilic bacteria rather than the true thermophiles and the hyperthermophiles so we had certain you know ways of looking at otu data that we had developed while working on those hot spring otu data and we just you know utilized or we just translated that way of looking at things into these otu data and we were surprised to see that large number of uh, you know genera that were being reported in these data sets those genera did not have any cultured strain species or 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 isolate or even any report of any member of those genera which have or which have been you know reported for anaerobic growth so this negativity or or this i will say this negative finding the negative uh, intuition opened up this whole revolutionary science i will call it revolutionary all revolutions do not capture power but revolutions are revolutions where they try to say something which is idiosyncratic which is not exactly in line with the standard belief and 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 from there the zeal was obtained to really delve deeper and and to explore really whether aerobic life was possible in these sediments so i took up this matter with my collaborator dr mazumdar obviously he is a geochemist but with ample biological senses he is one of those rare geologists in india who has deep command over biology and a very very thoughtful and insightful understanding of microbiological processes he said rithiman this is uh, absurd no how can it be how can you just you know talk like that or or even even there must be something you know which you are missing out but looking at those otus tens and hundreds of otus i'm not i'm i'm, I'm not going to show you those excel sheets or those tables those were mind boggling exercises enormous literature survey exactly in the lines of that which turn did in the hot springs there he scan hundreds of hundreds of genera for the report of any any member strain growing above 42 degrees centigrade or 45 degrees centigrade and there he reported that 80% 90% of the otus they belong to taxa or belong to genera having no report of thermophilic existence or thermo tolerance even or any kind of laboratory existence or survival beyond 45 degrees centigrade exactly like the same way we found here that uh, we are looking at uh, otus which are affiliated to, to genera that do not have any report of anaerobic growth on any substrate in any laboratory in any part of the world so this was only a clue or i will say this is a cue from where we started this whole science and and be patient for 5 or 10 minutes i will take you through the whole journey so but this is not a data by itself this data was not publishable this data itself makes no sense but it was sufficient to give us you know a a a reason to really i mean to stake our reputation to stake everything because it was really a high stake thing and and i am again i'll i'll say that everybody gives the acknowledgement at the end of the talk but this is the juncture where i must give the acknowledgement my i must give the entire acknowledgement to my students and especially the student subhasaji bhattacharya who staked his uh, you know phd maybe he had faith in me that's why he staked his entire phd he staked his everything mm. so i i i must just you know be you know thankful to all 
those boys who due to some reason or other or some reasons better known to them they were all um, gung ho about going about this improbable pursuit anyway if you look at this uh, you know triangular series of uh, plots you will see <coughs> that with water depth such otus such otus or such kind of uh, taxa without any anaerobic uh, growth report they were increasing with sediment you can also see two very important groups the aerobic and do you do not need to look at all the pairwise correlations this plotted with that that plotted with this the important ones you can see on the left hand no, on, on the left hand vertical column in the previous slide you can see in the left hand vertical column what you can see in the previous slide is this going to the previous slide dr tagore in the left hand vertical column you can see two very important things the two blue cards you can see that there the abundance you can see the abundance at, as of now you you ignore the perchlorate respirers i will come to them later on the second blue cards when I mean, the blue represents that there is high spearman correlation that means this curve is not only linear it also has a very good pier so it is supported by high spearman yeah yeah and i have a request if you have on the youtube issue can you make this slide Yeah, uh, the present mode should be much bigger. Yes. Sorry. I I I I I I told you I am technologically challenged. I can't do all these things. No, I'm not talking about. He's not doing the stuff, guys, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, just a moment, sir. Can you just tell me what you have just told? Can you just make the slides in the presentation mode? It's 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 in a presentation mode, but the thing is that we are streaming in the YouTube also, so there is some problem with that. That is why it's the slide is a bit uh, slower in in resolution. Maybe what we can do is that we can put the slides later also for uh, anyone who can interested. They can uh, download the PDF version, but if there is some problem with the resolution at the YouTube, so that is why we have to make it sl small. Okay, okay, okay. okay. okay sorry, yeah. no, 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 it's okay. Okay, so go ahead, sir. Then. So yeah, uh, bring me back to the slide, please. Yes, yes, sure, sir. So can you see? Yeah, now? here you can see vertically from yes. top the next blue one, percentage abundance of aerobic methanotrophs, and that is going down. And I'm showing you only only the set data set for the core number five. Also in core number six, you can get similar kind of data, but I'm not you know making it crowdy. For simplicity's sake, I am only concentrating on the data from code number five. Here you can see that the percentage abundance of aerobic methanotrophs. What I mean by percentage abundance? This is the pure metagenomic data. This is not OTU data. This is percentage abundance of metagenomic reads affiliated to methanotrophic taxa. And methanotrophic taxa, you know, that this the, 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 this is perhaps one of the few metabolisms, methanotrophy and methanogenesis. Where, where largely the, the the processes are monophyletic. That means the groups that possess the, uh, uh, these properties, all members of the group possess those properties. I mean, not that they are polyphyletic, that some member possesses and some members don't. So um, it's good enough, you know, or as, as a convincing piece of data. And aerobic methanotrophs, you know that they can't survive without the existence of oxygen, without utilizing oxygen. So that reads, metagenomic reads from the various data points that we just talked about. And 0 to 400, this is not 400. This actually, the end point is 300. The scale is up to 400. This is the sediment depth in centimeters below the sea floor. So these two graphs, the bottom two graphs, the percentage abundance of metagenomic reads affiliated to aerobic methanotrophs and percentage of, you know, percentage of the relative abundance of Metagenomic reads affiliated to aerobic sulfur chemolithotrophs or the sulfur oxidizers, and they are all aerobic. And the processes they employ, they involve oxidase enzyme, which cannot perform or cannot really do their activities in the absence of oxygen. The metagenomic reads ascribed to these two metabolic types or the genera or, or, or the taxa that are monophyletically attributed with these phenotypes now reeds getting affiliated to these two groups so heavily down the sediment depth these were very encouraging data which made us you know much confident about 
the veracity of the phenomenon which we were exploring. On the next slide, in the very next slide, you can see that we followed it up with a culture-based experiment where we tried to, and, and also we did these two, I mean, these experiments also with code number five and code number six. There you can see in the next slide, I'm only showing the MPN, the most probability number count of chemo organo heterotrophs, and that too for only one core, but also we had executed this kind of you know MPN studies with respect to sulfur chemolithotrophs, the aerob aero under I mean cultures conducted in in tubes with just slurry sediments and, and um, sulfur oxidizing media, the minimal salt sulfate sulfur media under aerobic condition. And we got very high number of uh, live sulfur oxidizing aerobic chemolithotrophs down the sediment depths of both SSK42 by 5 and SSK42 by 6. By the way, this SSK42 is nothing but the identity of the crews. The name of the research vessel was uh, Sindhu Sankal, and this was the 42nd cruise of research crews of that Sindhu Sankal vehicle. So this SSK42 may be just coming up, cropping up every now and then as we keep on you know, presenting the data. And 5 is the core number 5, and 6 is the core number 5, which you saw in the context diagram at the very beginning. So this is encouraging that we could find, you know, live cultures throughout the sediment depths, live cultures, I mean, the live bacterial populations uh, of both organotrophs as well as chemolithoautotrophs, and in both core number five and core number six. Now, as if this was not all, you know, my students were brave enough at that point of time to mount a culture dependent isolation procedure where we isolated 30 strains in all, and those 30 strains could be classified under nine or 10 genera. And of those nine genera, six, six genera and six strains, I mean, particularly not only six genera, I will tell that six clusters of strains, which were under individual genera. So those clusters were represented by, you know, or many strains. Now here we are presenting data for one representative strain. Interestingly, six such clusters were such that their representative strains, when grown anaerobically under the presence of or upon being offered all kinds of anaerobic respiratory substrates, starting from sulfate, nitrate, and even uh, obviously ferric uh, Fe3, uh, then manganese, Mn4, and also humic acid. And ferric in conjunction with humic acid, then uh, formate for formate respiration, and even TMAO, uh, trimethylamine oxide, all kinds of even organic, simple organic compounds, which also are known to act as anaerobic respiratory substrates, which can be reduced as the terminal electron acceptor by anaerobic organisms. All these six strains, the representative strains, which you can see here were uh, affiliated to certain genera, Cerebacter, Gyparcaria, with Hylophaga, Halothiobacillus is Gyparcaria, nothing but I mean, a new version of a new fraction of Halothiobacillus strains have been converted to Gyparcaria. And, and these are very well known obligate, the Gyparcaria, the Halothiobacillus cluster. They are very, very well established obligate aerobe. The name itself was encouraging enough for the group to really, you know, believe in the data that isolating Gyparcaria from these sediments and isolation was done back to from 275 centimeters below the sea floor. This entire isolation technique, isolation procedure was conducted not at the surface, not even at the depth of tens of centimeters but at a depth of 275 centimeter, where if you can go back, if you just sometime later on, you know, the slides will be available in the YouTube. If you go back to this particular data point, 275 centimeters below the sea floor of the core SSK 42 by six, from where the strains were isolated. Then you will see also that this was the point where there was maximum amount of methane. That means the existence of methane itself in such free state it, 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 it showed that it was sufficiently anoxic, it was sufficiently eutinic, because sulfide was also there at this point. The entire SSK 42 by 6 core, the entire SSK 42 by 5 core was replete with sulfide down the depth. And from 250 centimeters centimeter onward in SSK 42 by 6, methane had started appearing to vouch for 
the anaerobicity of the environment, the eugenic nature of the environment. So from that point of view, it was it was you know highly idiosyncratic to be retrieving aerobic bacteria, obligately aerobic bacteria, which despite being offered, which despite being provided with anaerobic respiratory substrate, all the anaerobic respiratory substrates that are known to be utilizable by marine bacteria, they were provided to them, or there was likelihood of such substrates to be present in their habitat from literature. They were provided to them, but none of them could oblige us by, by growing or, or just showing any survival in the anaerobic cultures. Now comes the question of contamination. Of course, I must address this, and we did address that. The most important sources of contamination in collecting sediment cores and, and to, to be you know, informative to the audience, I must mention that these were all gravity cores, as you had already seen in the plates I had shown regarding the expedition itself that collage of so many you know, onboard activities at the very beginning, which I showed. There you saw that all those cores were gravity cores. That means weight was put on top of the core and they were simply thudded onto the, onto the sea floor by simple you know, weight application. And the deeper and then the more weight you gave, deeper the core went and then it retrieved your you know, sediment. So one of the major questions that may arise or that often arises in case of retrieval of gravity cores is contamination from the seawater. Because while the gravity core is going in, it, it, it passes the seawater. So maybe the seawater also remains at the core liner sediment interface. The core liner is nothing but a PVC pipe, just like your drain pipe which exactly fits the dimension of the metallic core. You put the PVC core liner inside, there's a core cap, and in the core cap, there is a catcher plug. Obviously, it goes back when the core goes in. Then after the core is completely, I will say, dug into the sediment, you pull it up with a winch, a steel winch, and while pulling it up, what happens is that that core catcher moves the valves in the other direction, and it locks, and your core comes out. So there is a possibility of seawater contamination of the upper surface of your sediment. Once you open the core liner, when you cut the core liner open, when you cut the D half of the core liner, the upper surface is likely or remains likely to be contaminated by organisms which were in the water color. And, and obviously you can see droplets of water also on the water color. So what we did, we scraped off a few millimeters, I mean, even up to one centimeter of the superficial sediments by taking sterile patchouli. And, and, and we did the scraping in the surface of the, in, in the direction of the diameter, in the diametric direction of the pores, and then started the sampling with cut syringes, and cut syringes were, you know, stubbed deep inside the pores and samples were retrieved, so there is no question of your halothalobacillus coming in from the saline waters of the Arabian Sea. So it was quite obvious that the halothalobacilli or the gypercaria, which we call them nowadays, they were there in the sediments, they were living in the sediments, they were alive in the sediments, and as you can see from here, the next data, this particular, you know, break in this thought process was brought about by Chair and I will, I mean, obviously, I mean, let, me, let us go back to this previous slide again. This right-hand data, this uh, heat map, this is a very interesting piece of data and, and at that point of time we were spoiling it out with a revision of the manuscript and then Chair was already stationed out there in California. Oh, no, he was there in South Dakota at that point of time. He proposed this experiment that why don't you do the genomes of uh, these bacteria? And you already have the metagenomes. We already have the metagenomes. Why don't we map the genomic sequences onto the metagenomic sequences and look at the distribution of these strains? So we did the, we, we sequenced the whole genomes of these six obligately aerobic strains. You can see them by their, uh, you can see them by their abbreviations, Kyparkeria, Cerebacter, um, Methylophaga, and then uh, your Stenogunas, Bausanensis, Sulfitobacter, and so on and so forth. And this is the, all these six, and the two cores. 
and you can see that the 275 centimeter of the SSK passing by six foot from where these trains were isolated, they are having the maximum abundance. Obviously, it was their native habitat. We got them from there, so their maximum relative abundance in terms of mapping of their genomic reads to the metagenome, the native metagenome which we had from those data points. But interestingly, the bacteria are omnipresent, not that the bacteria are nowhere, only one data point in the whole, I mean, uh, in this whole um, set of 25 data points, 15 here and 10 there. Out of these 25 data points, only one have a zero presence of a particular bacteria, Cerebacter. Cerebacter has a zero presence only in this uh, 45 centimeter of SSK 42 by 6. Elsewhere, at least, there is some read. Even if a paltry amount, small but definite amount of reads from these bacteria going and mapping onto the metagenome. So you can't just say that this was a stray event, that these isolates which were there were only restricted to only restricted to this 275 centimeter. It was an, uh, a, 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 an esoteric kind of a thing, some spurious thing, some some erroneous, spurious, you know, infringement of your sampling some sort of, uh, I, I will say, people, you know, love to call your history mythology. <laughs> people love to call your data artifacts, right? So that's the way the world goes. When when you have, um, you know, not so strong voice, uh, then obviously your history is better called mythology and your data are better called artifacts. So there was a, a little scope for your data now being called artifacts, that it was a spurious occurrence of certain esoteric strains in a particular depth and, and it was nowhere else in the entire sediment horizon which we were exploring. So we didn't stop here, we, we went further because we had to prove that uh, they were alive. But as of now, obviously, obviously I, I was convinced that retrieving live cultures, retrieving live cultures of obligate rocks from this scenic sedimentary horizon was evidence by itself that they were alive. Had they not been alive, how they could really come up and show up in your cultures, in your laboratory? Dead cells don't speak, no? Dead cells don't come up in your cultures. You had robust cultures and they showed, they performed experiments, they, they, they did everything that you wanted them to do in your laboratory. So isolation itself was enough evidence that they were alive. Maybe there could have been questions that whether they were alive and active, because remaining alive, there can be questions that, okay, they are dormant. Now, dormancy is something which is related to spore formation. In alpha, beta, gamma, proteobacteria, you hardly hear of spore formation. You know that spore formation is a preserve of firmicules. You know that the spore formation phenomena are preserves of actinobacteria, alpha proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria. Uh, uh, they, they hardly produce any, you know, dormant propagules. Nevertheless, so you cannot just, you know, keep on ifs and buts. What we did, we had metatranscriptomes, you know, mm, sequenced from this 275 centimeter and we mapped the similarly similar kind of mapping of these genomes on the metatranscriptome we had you know very healthy results with respect to broad based mapping but then another break was provided and also we did a mapping with respect to the aerobic respiration genes and interestingly, I, I, I actually forgot before uh, you know going into this that obviously the metagenomes also had enormous number of the assembled metagenomes. The 25 uh, you know data points, all those metagenomes were assembled and annotated. That was also a huge exercise that John did for us. 25 independent metagenomes, each having three to four GB data because they were duplicate data sets. They were assembled and annotated as though, you know, they were normal genomes. And looking at them based on their AGG, you know, classification of those annotated genes, we could clearly identify tens and hundreds of homologs of cytochrome C oxidases, both AA3 type, BD complexes, as well as CBB3 type and also host of oxidase genes which you already know that they can't you know be active or be functional without the presence of oxygen so that was the metagenomic data that was the assembled metagenomic data then you had the cultures then you mapped the cultures but still then we did another reinforcement by 
sequencing the metatranscriptome of this 275 cmbsf sediment sample and mapping the genomes back onto that metatranscriptome especially with respect to a curated database that contained the respiratory oxidases then another master stroke came up from one of our think tanks and I'm, I'm privileged to be really able to talk this out in the presence of two very great architects of this entire work two very very important players and and, and, and things maybe would have been complete if uh Sobosaji Bhattacharya the first author also of this paper would have been here anyway so another master trick was suggested by RC the great RC who is also here your beloved RC of NBU he said that why don't you map also these genomes onto a curated database from the genomes i mean you don't take the genomes themselves you you take the housekeeping genes like which are the indicators of metabolic activity dna replication dna repair transcription translation environment signaling cell division take those genes curate a sub database from the genome then map the metatranscriptomic reads then map the metatranscriptomic reads onto the genomes and see what amount of metatranscriptomic reads do map exactly onto those i will say those are those those we gave a good epithet we coined an epithet for the 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 general you know metabolically i mean the the, the metabolic marker genes metabolic activity marker genes so we did that and also got enormous results which were very very encouraging which you will be able to see in the next slide now this gives you a clear cut idea the next slide gives you a clear cut idea about which metabolic category actually attracted maximum number of genes you can see the entire thing from here okay but you can see that the genes in information the genetic information processing category the circle this is this is nothing but a bubble plot where the circle size tells you about the relative abundance of genes mapping onto those categories. Maximum number of metatranscriptomic reads mapped onto the genetic information processing. So what the bacteria was doing with genetic information processing if it was not alive at all. So it was replicating, it was dividing, it was replicating its DNA out there in an anoxic condition. So this itself could have made a story. This itself was a story and, and we were uh, you know quite elated and upbeat to report this. But obviously there was a question, there was a question, there ought to have been a question with respect to what was the source of oxygen. And we had to come up with this and maybe this is where we were, you know, chatting or wading into a controversial territory and which was way beyond our control that what was the source of oxygen in these euxenic sediments. Euxenic in the sense that they did not have, you know, known source of oxygen because oxygen has already been depleted way above several centimeters, several hundreds of centimeters above and sulfide being there free oxygen is very unlikely to remain intact because even sulfide reaches a concentration of one millimolar and the bottom water oxygen itself was two micromolar bottom water oxygen at the sediment water interface the oxygen concentration was two micromolar and within you know few tens of centimeters uh, the sulfide concentration reaches the millimolar level so very little chance of efflux and diffusion of oxygen with the pore water without being attacked and immediately reduced by the HS minus radicals that are so much you know abundant in these sediment pore waters. So what could be the source of oxygen or source of survival or sustenance of these obligately aerobic bacteria? So that was a manhunt. We had to mount this and we came up with certain findings. Uh, well, uh, this was uh, uh, another exercise and if you go back to that first triangular matrix like data which I showed for many correlations, many pairwise graphs, can Professor Thakur just take us back once, at least for once to that triangular matrix? Yeah, here I had told you that I'll come back to something called a perchlorate respiring bacteria that, that, that uh, will be useful and at that point of time initially I had told you not to look at this and now I will ask you to look at this. The left hand vertical column, look at the left hand vertical column where you have the topmost blue graph, blue circles or the blue, blue data points. That means it is also having a very high Spearman as well as Pearson, Pearson as well as Spearman correlation coefficient with respect to sediment depth. 
This is regarding the relative abundance of parturient respiring bacteria, which is increasing with sediment depth. Now, what is the beauty of parturient respiring bacteria? Parturient respiration or parturient disproportionation is one of those few metabolic processes that are oxygenic. Parturient respiring bacteria themselves are anaerobic. They produce oxygen for you. And interestingly, that oxygen itself, beyond a certain concentration, sometimes in the range of micromolars, if that oxygen keeps on accumulating in the chemical milieu, the parturient respiring bacteria lose their parturient respiring attributes. That is, in case of certain parturient respiring bacteria, even parturient respiration is irreversibly, irreversibly inhibited. So the parturient respirer cannot go back. Then when, what does it respire? Now the question is then, Parturient respirers can also respire nitrate, but we also know that in these unbioturbated sediments, unbioturbated in the sense that there is little faunal activity, macrofaunal activity at the sediment surface, which can, you know, dig in burrows and holes in the sediments, so that some little amount of nitrate, little amount of oxygen can percolate, can percolate into the sediment, you know, deeper down. So with little bioturbation, nitrate is also a very unlikely candidate to remain in the sediments or to remain within a few centimeters of the sediment. So nitrate is likely to be depleted within a few centimeters below the seafloor. Oxygen, as we already said, is likely to be exhausted by the catabolic activity of the organotrophic bacteria that were utilizing the entire high flux of labile organic matter on the seafloor. So what you only get for the perchlorate respirer survival is perchlorate itself. <clears throat> but then again, geological knowledge was not with us. Perchlorate itself is a very enigmatic compound, which is not, not known to be widely occurring in the environment. Rest aside, even leave aside that of marine sediments. Existence of perchlorate itself as, as a natural chemical is hardly, you know, detected anywhere in the biosphere. And as John spoke about Atacama Desert, Atacama Desert is one of those few places on Earth that perchlorate is detected in free existence. One of the reasons <coughs> hypothesized for this is that perchlorate is highly reactive for the microorganisms. And a huge number of microbial taxa have abilities to respire perchlorate. So the condition is that wherever you have microbial life, you are unlikely to get perchlorate because the bacteria would be reducing and disproportionating it immediately. Why Atacama Desert has accumulated perchlorate or why, they, why there is a buildup of uh, perchlorate only in Atacama Desert or in that kind of, you know, areas, even in the upper atmosphere? Because there is little life or no life to disproportionate the perchlorate or to reduce the perchlorate to chloride and oxygen. But here you could see that an indirect evidence in the form of the existence of perchlorate respirers, even increasing abundance of perchlorate respirers as per the metagenomic data, down depth the sediment horizons. And also the metagenomes, the assembled metagenomes had ample perchlorate respiring genes, both perchlorate re reduction and perchlorate dismutation, perchlorate reductase and perchlorate dismutase. Both these homologs were abundant throughout the two cores, SSK 42 by 5 and 6. Last but not the least, we also explored the Metatranscriptome. In the metatranscriptome, the perchlorate dismutase gene was not there, but the perchlorate reductase gene was abundant. So, from that basis, or from such a scenario, from such a, I will say, launching point, we hypothesized that perchlorate, although itself a very enigmatic compound, although was not detected by us in our, you know, incipient or very primordial. IC analysis, ion chromatographic analysis, we were not very adept to that at that point of time. Now our, you know, estimation techniques have improved in the laboratory where we can, you know, more efficiently detect far lesser amount of perchlorate with standards at least. We don't have samples at this point of time, but we have perfected our art of detecting low amount of perchlorate, if at all given a chance to, you know, detect that. But it is not exactly our cup of tea to go out and hunt and fish for perchlorate. It is a work of the geologist, of the chemical geologist. Nevertheless, it was up to us to hypothesize. We hypothesize that the perchlorate respiring bacteria, you know, forges. We can go back to the slides where we were subsequently. 
that the perchlorate respiring bacteria forge symbiotic association in the next slide we can see all these things we can sum up the entire story that the perchlorate respiring bacteria may well be forging some kind of you know symbiosis with aerobic bacteria and provide them the oxygen by mechanisms which are you know akin to mouth to mouth respiration like close contact of the cells and intercellular oxygen transfer without exposing the oxygen to the ambient h2s so that we proposed as a possible mechanism but again i am reiterating that it is not the fort of the paper the fort of the paper lies in the robust evidence of the existence of flourishing aerobic microbial life in a sediment horizon where there is no apparent geochemical reason to believe that free oxygen exists the rest is up to the future of research to go and explore the nitty gritties and also the mechanistic feasibilities and the scopes of such processes but we would like to end with the biogeochemical implications which is enormous i will just sum up and i will obviously as i told you i will not go into you can rest assured that i will not go into that pan continental margin story that i was you know interested in cooking for you this day itself that may be something we will take up on another day given the opportunity the biogeochemical implication of this unraveling of aerobic life in the uxinic sediments of onz is enormous because as this model tells you you can see that labile organic matter delivered to the sea floor in this part of the ocean is very high this is one of the most i will say one of the most uh, uh, not even rich these are most of, i will i will say this is a hot spot of carbon sequestration why is it so you can see that you have only few hundred meters of oxic water and the marine snow or the sinking organic matter soon passes through the through this oxic zone and enters a hypoxic territory where there is very little degradation and in the hypoxic territory also there is very little faunal activity for further transformation of the organic matter so what happens is that large amount of labile organic matter labile in the sense that they have been less reacted upon very little reaction has taken place on the organic matter so they are largely native they are largely intact and that's why labile because we know as organic matter is acted upon repeated transformation makes it refractory to further degradation so not only is the toc delivered to the sea floors very high the total organic carbon content delivered to the sea floors is not only high but also theoretically and expectedly labile in nature although the organic geochemistry is yet to be done it is of consensus in other parts of the world in other omzs similar studies have been conducted and the organic matter delivered to omz sea flows even in the black sea which is also a captive omz not connected to the global ocean but black sea is also black sea and baltic sea are also actually mimicries of this kind of a scenario enormous studies have been conducted to show that the organic matter delivered to these kind of sea flows are highly rich in organic components now as i said in the first study you saw that in these cores the anaerobic processes heightened sulfate reduction heightened smtz shallowed that means methanogenesis also elsewhere on the two flanks of the omz methanogenesis was taking place at a deeper depth but here methanogenesis was happening at a shallower depth sulfate reduction was more hectic and what all these things mean and also anaerobic oxidation of methane was taking place these things mean that there is a proven abundance of simple fatty acids because those simple fatty acids are the substrates for sulfate reduction acetogenesis methanogenesis and all these kind of anaerobic carbon sulfur cycling processes now simple fatty acids can only be obtained by degradation of the complex and labile organic matter that is being delivered to the sea floor now this was a gap how could the labile organic matter be converted to ample abundant copious simple fatty acids while there is little or no oxygen in the sediments or there is little documented aerobic degradation activity 
the only resort was anaerobic hydrolysis and fermentation but we know as a microbiologist we all know as microbiologist we all know the limitations of anaerobic hydrolysis and fermentation in degrading all kinds of organic matter so there was a gap in the entire jigsaw puzzle so you can see that the yellow things the yellow scribblings they were all the components of the or the aspects of the biogeochemical cycle which were known and the green parts we just you know humbly added to the thing that aerobic degradation is also a supplementary process that can add to your enormous supply of simple fatty acid that in turn fuel the hectic anaerobic biogeochemical carbon sulfur cycling in this part of the global ocean so this has implications with respect to not only oceanographic biogeochemistry but also anaerobic sludges bioremediation processes and all kinds of other man engineered as well as natural anaerobic environments including such anaerobic environments which exist within human body parts so these kind of cryptic processes crypto aerobic processes their mechanistic basis as well as their biochemical or biogeochemical implications as the case may be you know environmental or human body related intra intra human or animal body these things will obviously we believe we believe and so has the editors of where we published that these are going to create some noise in the thought process of you know microbiologists ranging from or or i will say the metagenomics as well as the community biologists microbial ecologists who deal with ecosystems you know starting from uh, environmental sample environmental habitats man engineered systems as well as animal cellular and intracellular or intra organic body parts so that's the way it is so for the day i will stop here and i will urge uh, professor thakur to take me straight away to the last slide where obviously i should put up my formal acknowledgement and and this is the way it is and of course you can see from the left our beloved rc is here
is. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I was waiting. So thank you, sir, for your time. And it was an interesting, a very interesting talk. And uh, we really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope all the audience over here are, uh, are eager to ask some questions. So maybe they can put up in the chat section. OK, so if, uh, if anyone has question, they can ask one by one. That will be easier for me. So you can just turn on your uh, uh, microphone and ask, sir, directly your questions. There is one question from Deep Chanda. If uh, Deep is here, Deep Chanda. OK, so I don't know if Deep is, can hear me. Uh, there is, uh, I think there is some question from Chan only, yeah. Chan, you can ask, uh, sir, if you have any question. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, sir. So it will be all... No, sir. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, if anyone has any question, please uh, put a uh, question directly to sir. Uh, maybe Professor Chakrabarti can, <laughs> can say a few words. Sir, I think he has just joined. Professor Chakrabarti? Yes, sir. Yes, if anyone is there, they can ask question. Yes, yes, John, you can ask. Yeah.
<laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for taking time off from your busy schedule and for joining us uh, for this webinar. And uh, we hope that in the future also we'll get to hear from you. And yes, sir. <laughs> sure, I'm sure, sir, that yes, sir. So, uh, so we have come to the end of the session. So, uh, so before ending this session, I would like to thank few people for uh, making this webinar a success. So, I would like to thank our guest, uh, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Chan Rai and Dr. Uh, Ridhiman Ghosh for uh, making this webinar possible. And I would like to thank Professor Randi Chakraborty for agreeing to be the guest uh, for this webinar and for encouraging and guiding us all through this webinar. And uh, I would also like to thank, of course, our university administration for giving us uh, the permission to conduct the webinar and also the money to uh, provide logistic support and other support for uh, this webinar. I'd also like to thank my colleague and coordinator, uh, Mr. Chiranjeev Sharkar, along with the scholars of this department for providing us the technical support. I know there is some few glitch uh, here and there regarding the uh, presentation of the PPT and all, but uh, we will be hosting it in the YouTube also. So we'll provide you the link for the YouTube uh, uh, streaming also so that it will be helpful. And maybe we can provide the PDF of the uh, presentation by uh, Dr. Roy and Dr. Ghosh in the description box of the uh, YouTube link. So if you want or, or if there is any uh, uh, part that you have missed, so you can go through the presentation in the PDF. So uh, all these things will be provided to you. And uh, lastly, before ending, I would like to say, a f I would like to take a few minutes to tell about something from our department, that is Department of Bioinformatics of uh, uh, University of North Bengal. And I know many of people are joining us and if uh, anyone is interested in, uh, uh, in bioinformatics and also we are conducting this one year postgraduate diploma in bioinformatics admissions for which are open for the session uh, 2021 and if anyone is interested in uh, bioinformatics or want to pursue a course in bioinformatics please you can visit the uh, NBU website because the admissions and details of the admission is there we'll also hold a link in the description box so if anyone is interested please pass on the information we are a newly developed uh, department and we'd like to uh, spread this uh, bioinformatics to the people to the students of this region and all over the India. So if anyone is interested in pursuing a course in bioinformatics, so there is a course that we have started that is the one year postgraduate diploma in bioinformatics. So we have come to the end of this session and I would like to end uh, it here only. Thank you. Thank you all the participants. Thank you the guests for joining us and hope to see you soon with another webinar which will be again hosted in the YouTube channel. So we are, we are trying to 
regularly conduct some webinars and training programs for our students to popularize bioinformatics. So hope to see you again. Uh, thank you all. Okay, goodbye.